I don't, I've never had a better singular, like singular moment of excitement than at UFC 292 when Sean O'Malley knocked out Aljamain Sterling. Good. When I saw him get buckled and fall to his knees, I got up. Oh, oh. <laughs> Everyone in that, there's no one in the crowd that was seated at that Except moment. Except for the two people, people behind, behind us behind that us. were rooting for Aljamain Sterling. <laughs> Looking for people to cheer with, to be excited with. I look back. Yeah. They're making a Walking Dead game that is based on the first four seasons of the television show, and you can affect the outcome of the story. So certain plot points where one character kills the other, you can change that event from happening. Yeah. And thus creating a new storyline within the game, within the show. Ahsoka was Anakin Skywalker's Padawan. Spoiler alert for Star Wars, Anakin Skywalker turned into Darth Vader. So Darth what? Vader's Damn. ex Padawan. Okay. What? Crazy. It's not true. That's impossible. There's a lot at stake. There's a lot that Ahsoka's experienced. There's a lot that Ahsoka has gone through that I think is very important to this timeline and to the lore of Star Wars. <laughs> If I'm really fucking tired, I'll knock out. Yeah. But uh, if I have to keep going, then I'll get silly. Like, I have to stay up. Yeah. So eventually it hits, and then all of a sudden everything is just, like, <laughs> funny. You're too tired to deal with your emotions. You're just... Do you know who? Do you know who, who's a fiend? So I, I get like that as well. And me and Gabe, you know Gabe? Yeah. Uh, my best friend Gabe, we love to just, like, every once in a while, he'll, like, hit me up, and he'll be like, yo, like, it, we used to have sleepovers all the time. But then it's like not much sleepovers, but now we kind of just like meet and we're like, yo, you're trying to do like a late night drive. Uh -huh. And then it, it, this is one of the benefits of having like a, like a best friend that's like with you. Yeah. Is that like random late night drives? We either get emotional and we just talk about every, all our emotions and everything like that, or we're just staying late at night, going to CVS, buying like junk food mm -hmm. and just like sitting in a car and talking and being like drunk tired. Yeah. And I love those moments with them. Cause like, that's when we just open up, release everything. And it's like the most fun. Yeah. You've told me that before. Those vibes are great, man. Oh, just getting to really open up and talk. It's so helpful, especially yeah. to have a friendship where you can do things like that and you feel relief after you do it. Yeah. You know, and you know, the other person's willing to hear you out and also dump their feelings too. It's like a mutual thing. Cause yeah. you don't want to, friend who's always the person dumping everything and oh, yeah. you don't get to and it's like okay this isn't really a relationship this is pretty one-sided therapy session exactly yeah. which yeah. i've been in those kinds of relationships and it's Brutal. like how many different roles am i playing yeah as just when i'm, when I'm just supposed to just be your friend yeah and it's very taxing so, on you as well because you got to deal with all yeah well navigating relationships are complicated i run into this thought often like depending on whether it's your parents or your partner or your friends like there are certain hats you have to wear with certain relationships and yeah. there's certain sacrifices you have to make and it's uh, especially the more people you have in your life like it can be very taxing and dynamic and i feel like i've always had a pretty small friend group kind of for that reason yeah where it's like i don't let many people in my life so and I do that intentionally. It yeah. protects me, protects the people around me. And, you know, that's something that I think is, has to be earned too, you know? Like I think friendship should be something that's valued highly. Yeah. You know, not everyone is your friend. Some people are out to manipulate you. Some people are out to cheat you. Some people are out for your, you know, whatever benefits they see. Some people are out for, I mean, millions of reasons. So... Yeah, and I think it's really important for people to find good friend groups. And yeah. maybe not even groups, just find one person that you find some confidence in and that you feel like you have something in common and can share yeah. with. It's important to have an outlet. It also depends on like where you are in your life, too. Because I, I was actually talking to someone recently about this, too. Like I think, though, when you're in a committed uh, romantic relationship, it's important to keep your circle somewhat small, I feel like. You and your partner is that's the only communication that should really be happening when it comes to private things and um, 
you know, deep emotions and stuff like that. That's something that I think is important to keep sacred when it comes to a romantic relationship. Like wearing a hat, the, yeah. the different hats with the different relationships with friends. You know, if you're not with someone, you don't have a partner, you can give that to other people. But yeah, it's an important dynamic, I think, to have now being, it's crazy. I can't believe I got married this year. I can't believe it. It's like, wow, it hasn't yeah. even been a year either. Yeah. It's been a wild ride, man. This this year has been crazy. <laughs> but being with Bella for eight years has just taught me yeah. so much about so many different aspects of life. Yeah. And I mean, now we've basically like grown up together Honestly, in many ways. I've been with uh, V for two, two and a half years, going on to three years now, fairly soon. Uh, and even then, I feel like, Man, like I feel we spent a lot of time together. It's only been three years, but mm -hmm. like we've gone through a lot. I feel like in those years, like there's just been so many different situations that we I felt like we've grown together in. Yeah. And we've done it so seamlessly and so smoothly where it's kinda like yeah, you know, you just feel like you like, yeah, kinda like you said, you kinda just grew up with her. Mm -hmm. So it's it's yeah. And finding someone you can flow with, like there aren't many walls that you feel in the relationship. Like things can just kind of go smoothly you yeah. know um and it uh you know whoever their partner is because we were talking about like you know uh like i have my my friend gabe my best friend gabe and he's been my friend for years um when you do find a partner they should be, feel like a best friend so you should Absolutely. be able to like want like not only like you can talk to them but it's like you want to talk to them uh -huh. like with v bro like i'm an open book like mm -hmm. i tell her everything mm -hmm. as you should and like immediately and it's not even because of like oh like i have to but it's like stuff happens like i want to tell yeah you're like, the person i want to run to yeah. when things are good when things are bad you're the first person that comes to mind and you want to be able to be comfortable enough to tell it because yeah what happened uh yesterday yesterday was yeah yesterday yesterday i got flirted on hard at dunking oh, donuts because this woman like there's like a brazilian woman she just like met me um at duncan what'd she do um bark at you no or? but she was like brazilian she was like oh i've been here for like only uh, like uh, under a year and i'm like oh like yeah that's cool like where are you from and everything and because like she you know, she was talking with my dad as well um because we found out like everyone there was brazilian so we just started mm. talking with people there and then she was like oh like what are you doing around this like neighborhood or whatever and i'm like oh we went to do this she was like oh like that's cool like yeah man and then she just hit me with the yeah, I don't really meet that many people outside. It's it's tough to like find new people to go out with and things like that. And then just stayed quiet and looked at me and I was like, Are you do you want me to like, I'm just, like I'm stuck. Do you want me to take you out to yeah. do those things? And she was she was like, Oh, like because we were going out to buy a bike for my my brother's uh, daughter. Mm -hmm. And then she was like, uh, I just said uh which means like a daughter in law, but he, you know, referring to my dad. She's like, Oh, like is it Oh, is it like your your son? And I was like, no, 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 it's my brother's. She's like, oh, okay. And I forgot what else she said, but it was just some things where she was just asking a lot about my life and yeah. like very quick. I don't know how people do that. Yeah, I can't interact with people like that <laughs> who I've never seen before in my life. Like even when people start talking to me, I'm a friendly person, but there are certain scenarios like when I'm shopping or something, I'm not expecting a conversation. So when it happens, sometimes I'm down for it, but for the most part, I'm like, yeah. Why? Why are you talking to me? No, even me. I was giving her very dry. Like, like I noticed when she starts asking me stuff about that, mm -hmm. I'm answering all of them. I'm not asking anything back. I didn't yeah. learn anything about her. She, it's all <laughs> one sided. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But pretty much, short story, like long story short, like after all that happened, the very first person, like literally, I'm walking to the car. I'm already messaging V, like dying, laughing. Right. Like, I just got flirted hard with, her. <laughs> and she, and like, I love my relationship with her because yeah. I've had past relationships where I couldn't do something like that because right. I would have been in trouble. Even mm -hmm. though I didn't do anything, um, I would have been in trouble yeah. just because that person happened to find me attractive. Right. With her, I immediately told her and she's like, oh, we have to talk about this. Like, she's yeah. like, I want to know everything. Yeah, I mean, 100%. And that's just life. Like, those things happen. Yeah. You can't expect everyone else in the world to be blind and to know everything and assume everything about you. You know, there's people out there who would just hit on someone and they don't know what your, you know, relationship status is or yeah. where you are in your life. So it's, it's, there's no reason to be offended or to be jealous or to feel any of those feelings because yeah. they're unjust. It was, it was one way, yeah. you know, I was receiving this. There's nothing that I did to. Yeah, it's, it's not like I flirted back. I was just <laughs> yeah. Or, or something to, 
you know, initiate the flirting in, yeah. the, in the first place. I find it, I actually find it like I'm quite opposite to some guy. I like it when V gets hit on. You do? Yeah, because it's kind of like, it, I find it hilarious, right. first of all. when Like I, a compliment. I, yeah, and she she like sends me messages sometimes like at work or something. She's like, man, like this like random guy just hit on me or whatever. Or like if I'm kind of noticing like we're around someone that's new mm-hmm. and they don't know our relationship and I kind of see them gravitating, gravitating towards her. I kind of step back and kind of let it happen even just because I find it funny. And like, I know she's going to tell him. Right. But it's just like, it, at the end of the day, it's kind of like, yeah, I got a girl that like other yeah. people want. It's kind of yeah. fun. You see it as a compliment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get that. hundred percent. I mean, absolutely <laughs> valid. hundred percent. Uh, well, for anyone that's listening to the podcast right now, obviously, you know, based on the thumbnail, based on the title that we fucking went to UFC 292, we have so much to talk about so much to talk about we want to go through each fight and everything like that and we will by the end of the episode a hundred percent we're going to dedicate some time to it but before that we have a few things that we got we got to get through ahsoka is coming out law tuesday uh yeah okay uh, wait no uh tomorrow's tuesday uh wednesday i think it's coming out tomorrow i think it's i saw 23rd. a tweet that said that it, they were going to drop it a day early if they do that i I'm like 98.79% sure that it's dropping I mean, on Tuesday. I won't, I won't complain at all Yeah, if that's true. But. So for anyone who is wondering uh, where I am in the Star Wars universe, because I'm a huge Star Wars fan. <laughs> I've played many Star Wars games this year. I've watched a lot of the movies. I've watched all the movies I've seen. Most of the shows. Uh, but I was behind. So when I found out that Ahsoka was being announced, I knew, okay, I need to go into the backstory and really understand her character much more for anyone that doesn't know, but kind of understands the Star Wars universe. Ahsoka was Anakin Skywalker's Padawan. Spoiler alert for Star Wars, Anakin Skywalker turned into Darth Vader. So Darth what? Vader's Damn. ex-Padawan. Okay? What? Crazy. So, there's a lot at stake. There's a lot that Ahsoka's experienced. There's a lot that Ahsoka has gone through that I think is very important to this timeline into the lore of Star Wars. So I'm very excited to see it, not only in animation, but in live action this time. So I knew that Clone Wars existed, which is a television show that I think runs seven seasons, Yes, where it's really based around Anakin Skywalker and uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi and like missions and everything that's going on around the time of, you know, you know, just a few years before he actually turns into Darth. So I didn't get fully caught up. I only made it to season three. Which is very unfortunate. On Clone Wars? Yeah, because it's seven seasons. And then after that, there's a show called Star Wars Rebels mm. that also has her in it. And is, I don't even have five seasons, six, seven, nine, uh, a thousand probably. I think it's five. I think it's five, five seasons. Don't quote me. So my, be wrong on my mission when I found out about Ahsoka coming out was to be fully caught up with these two shows. I didn't do that. I did my best. So um, after this podcast, Screen Crush, which is a very, very good YouTube channel. Incredible YouTube channel. Highly recommend. If you're not subscribed, go subscribe. To Literally go subscribe. They cover uh, TV shows, movies, all that stuff. It's four seasons. Rebels? Four seasons. And I did check, and Ahsoka does come out tomorrow. Yep. Damn. Hell yeah. So let's say it drops tomorrow. Did it say a time? Uh, No. Okay, well, let's within the next 24 hours. I can't watch all those episodes, so I'm fucked. Yeah. So Screen Crush dropped this video that is like 127 hours in 23 minutes and goes through all the Ahsoka references and all the animations and all the comics, I'm assuming, and all that shit. Character arc. Sorry, Everything. Basically. So I'm going to watch that after this podcast so I can be fully caught up. I'm sorry to say. I'm embarrassed to say. I didn't watch the show. I, mean, I got to watch it through clips. And I, I'm in, sorry. In your defense, there's a lot. You it's know. a lot, man. And, you know, and, it, and I and I will admit all day, mm-hmm. the first two seasons of Clone Wars is a bit slow. It's tough to get through. Even season three is a little bit of a grind. Once you get and to I season tried, four, man. things pick up. You can't yeah. say I didn't try. <laughs> you but tried. Because he really gets on me with yeah. certain things, and especially Star Wars. And I don't blame him. He's on me. But I, I was hoping that you wouldn't give me a hard time today because I try. I really try. Not, There's some motherfuckers out here who don't even try. I'm no, like, no. and the other thing that I'm realizing is, and no disrespect to Star Wars, I love Star Wars, but I think I enjoy the lore and the feeling of being a part of this universe more than I enjoy the actual content. 
most of the time. There are exceptions to that, but I like the feeling of belonging yeah. that we're all watching this, that it's all something that we, you know, for the most part, very much enjoy and has deep history and so many amounts of content from comic books to movies to shows to everything. So, so saturated. Yes, there is a lot There's and a lot. not everything is fantastic. It's kind of like where Marvel's going to be at in, you know, 20, 30 years where there's going to be like, okay, there was these little pockets that were amazing, but because there's so much content, not everything was that good. Yeah. And it's hard for people to invest <clears throat> in it if they miss the boat. Like you're going to ask me to watch how many hours of content? Fucking I mean, a thousand? 20 to 30 years. I was going to say like, I thought you meant like now or in a couple Well, of now years. is like where Star Wars is at because they started in the 80s, right? Yeah. So if we just give Marvel another two decades, like it's going to be the same size because of course Star Wars is the biggest oh, yeah. film, television, entertainment universe that <clears throat> exists. So, um, so I think, I'm excited though. I think the 126 hours is is Clone Wars and Rebels. So that's how many, how much... Mm. Now that's I, where he got the number. That's just where I think he got the number from. I was wondering if it was that or like time of total appearance. No, because I I watched I watched most of the video and it's for the most part it's um, Club Wars and Rebels. So gotcha. I think gotcha. that's where he got that number from, and that's that's a lot. Gotcha. That's a lot to sit through, especially for those slow episodes. Uh, Club Wars Club Wars has so many incredible moments. Yeah. But for those slow moments, for those, I mean, even season seven, season seven. Yeah, and I, and I came on mad late, you mad did. late. You did. But Force Awakens came out twenty sixteen, twenty sixteen. I think the year think so. before that, or like six months before twenty fifteen. Mm -hmm. So six months before that was when I watched Star Wars Episode Four, which is the first episode of New Hope. That was the first time I ever watched it, Damn. and then I watched everything. Yeah. So I'm mad late, but I've been doing my due diligence to catch that's, up. That's all I want. I just want a little respect. That's not really your fault. <laughs> I mean, like Clone Wars, Clone Wars for me was like so um, nostalgic. Like, yeah. like I remember sitting in my room when I was like 10, 11, 12. I wish. Watching Clone Wars. And like that's when I like I watched it every week religiously. I thought it was the best show ever. And, and, and it is probably top top three. Not three uh, star wars shows for me it's <laughs> i remember watching it's clone so wars. good really yeah i i used to watch it and i've like very little and never uh chronologically i watch episodes here and there but i do remember there were a couple episodes where i think there's one specific episode where i watched like ended up watching mm -hmm. it three times and i was like i, I loved it but once again, you know, never got hooked onto it. Yeah. And never like actually continued yeah. following it. Yeah, I think which is also you a mistake. I kind of wish I didn't. I think you would really be into Star Wars. I really, think, I am. I think you really would be. I am. I am into Star Wars. I. I here's the thing. I there's so many things. You've I seen need all the movies. Yeah, all the movies. I've oh, watched, okay, okay. I'm watched here thinking the, that you don't know shit. Okay. No, no, no. I've watched all the movies. Um, I've watched you know the the first. Four, original four, right? Original it's three, four. and then three. three, and then three again. Six. Well, original actually, threes. with two in between there with Solo and... Um, no, no, no. I'm talking Rogue about one. like the, the old ones that before Disney stepped in. There was four? I mean, no, no, there was three. six. No, three? Three. We'll... we'll um, Damn, I'm completely lost right now. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. I've watched all the old ones. So <laughs> four, five, six are the first three. And those were all... Uh, back in the eighties. Yeah, and then there is the late seventies, eighties. Then there's one, two, three that got released, and then one, two, three. Yes, which was still done by George Lucas yeah. in the two thousands, but then Disney took over and did seven, eight, nine. Yeah, yeah. All right, so it was six. I was right. I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's six, but yeah, the the original six because I call that the original six. But even like the ones, even one, two, and three, he didn't really want to do that much. And yeah, he kind of jumped it's still, still kind of. I think that's of, when Disney came in. I know that Disney took over for real, starting with Episode Seven. But I don't know if in the early two thousands they had any publishing <clears throat> rights or something like that. Terrible. But imagine selling Star Wars to Disney. Yeah. Like, think about that. There are interviews of George Lucas early on in the days of Star Wars where he said he would never sell it. Yeah, and then he did. I mean, you can't. You can't keep that. it up. Can't keep it up forever. Yeah. Yeah. Stop. 
And Disney is willing to would, do it. It would take over a, your life. It would be the only thing yeah. that you ever do is Star Wars all the time. And like Disney had the budget, so he maybe he was thinking mm-hmm. it was like maybe they'll do it justice. You know, yeah. With that big budget, they can make the. I mean, they kind of you know drop the ball a little exactly. bit. Exactly. It kind of, but then it taints you know yeah. the memory and the history of everything that he's created, which is like. It's tough. It's like giving your finished art to someone to then add on to it, but then it kind of destroys yeah. what it was. It doesn't. It doesn't though, because even yeah, though depending people, on who you ask, yeah, yeah, people looking at the like the new movies, they still kind of separate it. Because I even I said it was like the original six. Like for me, those were the good ones, and then pretty much any other one that went before that, I look them very mediocre. Mm-hmm. But like even then, like I feel like a lot of people there are like they still realize like yeah. These were like the goats of the movies. And then all the other ones that came after, they're like, yeah, they're all right. Well, even, I mean, one, two, and three were hated for a very long time. I think that was. It weird. wasn't until Obi Wan was coming out where like the conversation kind of started to change. I think that hate that he got kind of contributed to him selling. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure. People hated. It was bad. People hated him especially, as Anakin Skywalker. Hayden Christensen, um, they hated him. Yeah, Jar Jar they did. Growing up, I remember everyone was shitting on it. Jar Jar Banks. And Jar Jar Banks, all of that. Yeah. And then Luckily, you actually watch bad. it back and you're like, damn, some of these are bangers. One is actually not that bad. Two is actually pretty bad. Three is very good. Yeah. Three is very good. I like them. I like I liked all of them. Star Wars is solid. Yeah. Star Wars is solid. So I got to get on my grind for this fucking show. But there's just too many... <laughs> Too many things to watch. Too I many think. things there to is. watch. There is. I'm and that's not even only that. with Star Wars. Like, with Marvel as well, there's a lot of shows. Or I, I But haven't thankfully, watched. post-COVID, I feel like it's kind of slowing down when it comes to the big, big, big things. Yeah. So, I think we're in a period where it's going to be a little bit more... It's going to be a little bit easier to handle. Yeah. Especially if you're fans of Marvel and Disney, who are basically the same thing. You know, because things are going to be much more spread out. Even the Marvel shows are spread out now. And not not everyone's in a rush to get out content, you know, in the same way that it was during COVID. You know, it's just like get it out. Just Star Wars, anything, is, get it out. Star Wars is starting to spread out a little bit more. Star it's, Wars it's is spreading a, out. It's been a while since, not a while, but it's been a good amount of time between shows. Yeah, and I feel like Ahsoka. and I feel like in some episodes we've talked about like just giving it time, you know, and then like it'll be it'll be more polished if they just give the. The producers, the creators, the editors, all that, just more time to be able to polish the content Don't and come out it. with yeah. quality over, you know, quantity. So mm-hmm. hopefully that's changing. I think that era is here and we're in it. Thank God. Which leads me to my next thing, MW3. Because it's kind of in the same subject because I've heard with this new COD, Modern Warfare 3, that they're doing all of the MW2 maps. Yes, I saw that. Which is very... Like, why aren't you doing the MW3 maps for MW3? I think it's because... You're doing all the MW2 maps. I think MW3 map. was so underrated, but MW2... MW2 <sighs> maps just hold a special place in everybody's heart, especially... Yeah. I mean, but when, it's when not play, MW2. It's MW3. It's what the fuck, bro? Yeah. You guys are now picking off like the uh, like your other games. No, come on, bro. They didn't realize it. I remember what they're what doing they anything they can to sell bro. this damn game. So they're saying, you know, what, we're gonna sell MW three, but it's actually MW two. MW three. That makes some, no sense. Bro. MW, How the fuck does that make sense? MW three had some goaded maps. Yeah, okay. and they're not doing them. I mean, eventually maybe they'll do them, but even then, it doesn't justify the fact that you're doing MW2 maps. How does that fucking make sense? Somebody tell me how does that how that makes sense. Well, you know, it's the same timeline. It's the same story. The blah, 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 blah. No. doesn't make any sense. It's invalid. Yeah. It, it, for, for people that like the maps and play the game, it's going to be like, okay, cool. I get to do it. But it, it, it doesn't give me a new perspective. On how I feel about Call of Duty right now. Yeah, T Martin, right here. You're all you're biting original. off of old shit. Mm-hmm. You can't come up with anything new. Your lack of creativity is shining right now, mm-hmm. and your desperate need to sell copies of this game is so frustrating. Yes, it's so frustrating. You money chasing motherfuckers. I, I mean, like, at what point does it just become not a new game? It hasn't been. It's just I mean, like- but. It, it's it's we talked about this in dms right like the cod community is so split yeah right you have the old heads who loved how it was and those are usually the people in the competitive scene 
who love how it was and they don't want it to change. And then it changes and they're pissed. And then you have the casuals who want just certain parts of the game to exist because that's, you know, they enjoy it in that way. And then the developers don't really please either person. And then the most of the time they're pleasing the casual over the old heads. And the old heads are, you know, 90% of the community. Like yeah. COD wasn't a big thing until recently, but it's been out for a while. And many of us have been playing for decades. So fuck you, Call of Duty. <laughs> That's what I have to they're say. Just, but, they're but. just doing so much, so much extra shit. And my stupid ass is going to play it this year. It is. I am. That's I'm what I was going to ask. I was like, but are you going to get it though? Yeah, <laughs> Probably. It's so I don't want to though, and they know that. That's why it's so frustrating, because it's like, damn, you have me by the balls, and you know it, and you're proclaiming it, you're shouting it. Yeah, it's like, fuck, man, you don't have to yell so damn loud. (laughs) It happens every time a new Call of Duty comes out. Yeah, as of recently, I did it with Cold War, Modern Warfare. But at least then it was like a new attempt at something. No, no, no. But I said to myself, I'm not getting this Call of Duty. I'm not getting this Call of Duty. And then I play the beta. I'm like, yeah. All right, yeah, I'm probably still not probably gonna get it. Then my friends convinced me to get it. I get it. I play it for three months and then I delete it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. COD doesn't last past however much time. Past definitely not past January. Yeah, definitely not past. You won't catch me playing COD in February. I haven't had a Call of Duty on my on my Xbox in a while. Yeah, no, a while. And it's uh, and it's gonna stay like that for anyone. Hopefully. For everyone listening, Call of Duty is a very sore, sensitive topic for me because I don't even need to go there anymore. But anytime we talk about COD, I'm going to get in a bad mood Yeah, because <laughs> fuck you, Call well, of Duty. It has such a big impact on the gaming community because it, it's just so dry right now. Mm-hmm. And Call of Duty used to be that thing where you would go back to and play casually, mm-hmm. uh, kind of as a filler. Mm-hmm. In between time. Too and now sweaty it, now. It, exactly. Too it, sweaty. It's not even enjoyable. It's but not. then even in the casual side, like, it, they don't do enough stuff for the competitive people. So, like, even if you want to mix it up, the option's not really that sharp. So, but whatever, man. Anyways, in other news in the gaming world, if you haven't seen... Have you seen The Walking Dead? No. Okay, so neither of you have seen The Walking Dead. No. All you need to know is that it's a fantastic show. Oh, yeah, that, that one. Many I seasons. I that think I they're heard. on season 11 or 12 right now. But they're making a Walking Dead game that is based on the first four seasons of the television show. Okay? Mm. And you can affect the outcome of the story. Mm. So certain plot points where one character kills the other, you can change that event from happening. Yeah. And thus creating a new storyline within the game, within the show. Type of whatever now, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Now the because they already had a Walking Dead game before. It is yes. completely separate. Knock it out. Not yes. all connected. This walk that Walking Dead game that you're referring to exists within the same universe. Starts at the same. It starts at the beginning of the first day of the apocalypse, mm-hmm. and it's just a, a different group of people on another side of the world. Same thing that they did with the spinoff show. I don't know if you heard about that. I forget what it was called, but uh. Uh, the the fucking rise uh, of the walking dead or something like that fear of the walking fear dead. of the walking dead that was pretty good thank you close. <laughs> um so this one is just based on the canon the, the tv show that was released same characters same events and then you play through it and you can change certain events now it hasn't been clarified what you can do and what events you can change but we watched the trailer earlier before you got here and they were showing some really big scenes that you could change. Wow. So that has me very excited because especially if that's good and that works, that idea is fire. Because mm-hmm. what if is just a great idea in general. I think yeah. it started with Marvel Comics. Uh, someone have to fact check me. And then it re-emerged uh, recently with the Marvel animated TV show. Where they did a whole season of What If, which is basically taking... Uh, certain events that happened in the early Marvel movies of like the first phase. And what if we change this one thing about it? Right. So like, um, what if, um, what if Captain America was actually Peggy Carter instead of um, Steve Rogers, you know, certain things like that. So now they're taking that concept, which I love so much. And I've said should be in the star Wars universe. I Absolutely. think there are some comics of what if star Wars, I think, 
Not sure. But if they did that in show or a movie, I mean, show, let alone just a show would be insane, but a game as well, you know, I was thinking earlier, like, what would be one of the best what ifs? I was going to ask you that. And I didn't spend too much thinking, but the first thing that came to my mind was what if uh, Anakin Skywalker never turned into Darth Vader? No, because that's a huge like ripple effect on the universe. Yeah, yeah. It would. So that's that's like one of my favorite ones that I think I would love to see Star Wars do, and I think they definitely could, especially if they went the animated direction like Marvel did. I don't know if you watched the Marvel What If, but a couple of them, yeah. animation was clean. Some of the stories were really good. Others yeah. were like, oh, you know, okay, but mm-hmm. but for that kind of show. Like, even if they get a few right, I get super happy. Yeah. Animation for me is, like, something I always want to support, you know, especially with um, what we've been able to see with uh, Into the Spider-Verse and now Across the Spider-Verse. Like, that level of animation so and beautiful. illustration and attention to detail is just so beautiful. It's such a beautiful art form that whenever there's animated film or anything like that, I love to support it because I hope that stays around forever. I yeah. hope that... That's something that we never, um, you know, never walk away from. And I hope is always held to like the highest regard because there's so much animated content that is much better than live action content, Mm -hmm. much better, infinitely better, but it doesn't really hit those mainstream numbers unless it's like a Pixar movie because it's really like those kids are selling tickets because yeah. they're bringing their parents, they're bringing their family, they're bringing their grandma, their grand. And so the now re- it's like and the rewatchability. Yeah, on those movies exactly. Like insane. I don't go to Spider Man, invite my parents, invite you know, like all these people to take care of me and watch me. So selling a ticket to a kid is like selling six tickets, not one ticket. Yeah. So it it was nice to see in these recent years, like into the Spider Verse, across the Spider Verse, hit those kind of numbers and that recognition especially with like a comic book thing, even though we're in the comic book era, but so dope to see. I'm hoping that that happens more and we get that in video games because that would be sick in video games because it's like I've said many times, it's the best medium. So not only are you giving me a what if story, but you're letting me play through it. I make the decision. Yeah. And then what if we get to the point, going back to all of our conversations with AI, what if it's so elaborate that you can change literally any decision and actual new outcomes yeah. develop? We don't know how sophisticated the AI is going to be in this game. We don't know how sophisticated the butterfly effect, the multiple outcomes. We don't know how many they've created. We don't know how intricate it is. But this is a dope first step, and who knows? I'm going to start looking into it a little bit more, but I'd be very curious to see how developed the AI is that they're using for this, or is this like... Oh, we've written, you know, 20 outcomes and we're only going to give you two or three opportunities within the game to actually change something. It's yeah. mostly you playing through it and then we give you like an opportunity in certain parts. It'd be cool if you have complete like control over it because that, that is an interesting thing to think about is like you're watching a show or watching a movie and then like the characters are just making some decisions. You're like, bro, I would never have done that. Like I, I would have done this way better. It's kind of like not a developer's being like, all right, bet. Like, what would you have done? Yeah. Like, and that then what idea if you like, could like pause it and then like change it? Yeah. Or if <laughs> like you're kind of like watching a show and then like an episode finishes and you're like, all right, I'm going to continue. I'm going to play the game now. And then that same episode, have, and I'm now going to be playing in the game. It's like, this is what I would have done different or whatever, like that. Mm-hmm. Like, just being able to like that, opening up that whole genre of, of things now where it's kind of like, yeah, like movies you like or shows you like. It was like, yeah, what would you have done differently? Don't like, I'll give you a chance to play it. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. And I think it speaks to a deeper note too. Like, I think most people who are trying to pursue something better for their lives are in constant, um, they're in constant search of being the first player in their lives, like being in control, making the decisions that they want to make, having the outcomes they want, being happy, being having and wanting all of these things. And for some people, it can be really hard. You know, they don't feel like they're in control of their lives. But having a video game that not only allows you to be a certain character within these certain restraints and then be free, allowing you to create a life, a decision, a world on your own would just like give people uh, a reason to never be themselves (laughs) potentially and just live that life. Or hopefully it's just another piece of entertainment and maybe it, you know, pushes people to like, hey, this is a game. Like if... Life can be like a game too. Why don't you first play your your life and you could do all these things that you're trying to accomplish in this game? 
which you know in return is like a reaffirming thing and gaming can help in many ways yeah i i think you know some of these old heads they uh don't really understand like what gaming is to certain mm-hmm. people they think it's just like it really is like an outlet for certain people like you get to develop this whole new personality this whole new genre of thing that you get to explore and things like that and I feel like uh, gaming nowadays, it's becoming a lot more, you know, oh, 10 times more than what it was before, but more appreciated. There are still some people that they just won't see it and they'll mm-hmm. never will see it. But like it is something where it's kind of like, yeah, it's not just a silly thing. Like it's actually way more elaborate. Like stories are way better than movies. Mm-hmm. You're actually developing, developing this emotional connection with this character mm-hmm. that you're controlling and things like that. Mm-hmm. Like games have just become so elaborate mm-hmm. compared to how it was before mm-hmm. where it's kind of like yeah it's like an actual genre you know you, it's have not you just ever a seen, silly thing have you ever seen those videos on youtube where um kids or people will play like a, a rap song that their parents have never heard for the first time mm, or like yeah. a certain artist or they'll show them like a certain scene in a movie that they've never seen that would be an interesting series like playing a really deep revered video game for like old heads yeah for like parents for, for, for like grandparents someone. for the generation that only saw maybe like the development of pac-man and that's the only idea of video games that they have in their mind like they don't understand what's available nowadays my parents i was thinking my, my parents they don't they see it as silly they mm-hmm. like they 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 don't see any game they just think it's it's a silly thing and it's kind of like they they don't have the idea or the concept it was like you don't know how like, deep this thing's gone. Like, yeah. We, we went from, you know, just trying to collect, you know, coins to now playing a movie. Yeah. Like gaming has evolved ten t- tenfold. It's it's one of the best mediums. I think it's the best medium in entertainment. I, I think I've asked you this before when you were streaming, but, um, and it's a tough loaded question. So, Give it to me. I love yeah, it. We, we can talk about this, but I mean... You obviously have a big passion for gaming. Mm-hmm. Um, what specifically about video games, though, that resonates more with you? Is it nostalgia of it because you did it since you were a kid? Or is it like kind of like the story connecting with a character, building out a whole other life? You know, that's a great question. I think it's changed um, since I was a kid to when I was older it's had different seasons of meaning for me. Yeah. And especially after streaming and playing games with people and for people and in that kind of way, that also was another shift in mindset of how I saw video games and what video games was offering me at that time. So I don't know. I've gone through many different phases, you know, like when I was a kid, um, it was kind of like a nostalgic thing, right? You'd play because you, you would remember the time with your friends and then you would play to play with your friends and all that. And then as I got older, I, I re I rediscovered it with, you know, more deeper stories and like last of us and things like that. And then, you know, my appreciation and the way that I saw it then was like, almost like I could play a game and it was teaching me a lesson. Yeah. Kind of like how I saw movies as a kid, you know, uh, I bet a lot of people can relate to this, that not saying my parents didn't raise me or anything like that, but I, I spent a lot of my childhood learning from television and TV shows and certain characters and, yeah. and characters of video games. Like I feel like a lot of certain things that I grew up believing came from entertainment, like I kind of taught me in many ways, or I found myself in certain characters and that would help me develop who I am and stuff like that. So, you know, I've, I've had different phases with gaming. And then once I started streaming, uh, it was really about sharing my experience with others, yeah. you know, sharing this story with someone else, sharing this with the other viewers and with the other chatters and, and trying to connect on, on a deeper level with gaming. But it was actually funny because I, I didn't get to accomplish that as much as I wanted to at certain points, because especially in the beginning, because I found that people were there for me much more than they were for the game. And that wasn't really what I was going for. You know, people liked it when, I would pause the game and talk or even before the game starts, you know, like talk to the chat and go back and forth. But then once the game started, like there was a little bit less interest. It was more of like uh, a desire for constant communication and, and response to questions and stuff like that, rather than 
experiencing this game with me and making commentary on what we were experiencing together. Yeah. There were some people like that in the chat that I'm so grateful for and have made those experiences much better. You know, people like Podu, who's a very active community member. So, you know, and then things kind of evolved from there. So I would, I would say now me, uh, the way that I look at gaming is, uh, probably more of like, um, and I also kind of missed the phase of like escapism, which happened right before I started streaming, where it was like a place to get lost in, yeah, a place to forget about the world, uh, an outlet, you know. So it's changed. My yeah. relationship with it has changed a ton, um, and then I think now is um, is kind of like a, an event thing, you know, like a new game comes out, and I know everyone else is excited about it, so I want to share it with them, yeah. You know, it's not as much as that desire to just be playing anything at any time. It's it's that that idea of sharing with people is what I think the most exciting thing for me in my life all the time. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite things about my wife is that I get to share things with her. I get to share my life with her, share my memories, share my excitement, my dreams, my insecurities. And that is a really comforting feeling. Because if anyone has ever experienced loneliness, like loneliness is deep and painful and very isolating. And it's it's not a fun place to be in. You feel very detached from the rest of the world. And um, I think humans aren't meant to operate like that. No. You know, we're meant to be together in community and sharing and helping each other. We naturally gravitate towards community. Exactly. No matter where you are. Exactly. And, you know, I experienced that a lot when I moved to Atlanta, having a lot of that isolation, you know, doing long distance with my wife, who then was, you know, we were only dating three years. So it was, uh, yeah, loneliness is not, a, is not a fun thing. So sharing things with people is, is in this later part of my life, as I've realized, is, is what really excites me. Yeah. When it comes to multiple things, like me just as a friend or me as a person in, in a relationship or me as a, a creator or someone as a, or a creative, all of those different channels of who I am really come alive because of my desire to share with others. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's, that's another reason why. Um, and, and I think that's really prominent probably in our generation. Now. Yeah. Definitely coming up in, in the world of podcasts you know, I think people are realizing that having a voice is comforting and sharing your thoughts with people can be very comforting. And that's a great wave to be on, to be honest. You know, I think that's a much better wave than other entertainment waves we've been on to, yeah. to, to get people excited to share their feelings and their opinions with other and be in communication and find community who share similar voices and share opinions, even if they're not yours. Um, it's that's, a, that's a healthy thing. Yeah. That's a very healthy thing. You should be open to sharing your thoughts and feelings. It's okay if people disagree and don't find those feelings or, or those uh, ideas in line with theirs. But that's a part of being a human. You yeah. disagree and you find things you agree with. And, you know, we were even talking about a podcast that I shared with you um, uh, the other day with uh, Hotep Jesus who yeah. went on Joe Rogan and like... Um, and just the different way that you and I process that podcast too. So, yeah, I mean, this generation is definitely a generation that certain opinions get looked down upon, or just the fact of you having an opinion. It doesn't matter what it is. If mm -hmm. a person disagrees on you, it becomes visceral. Uh -huh. So it's kind of like it having the outlet where, like, you know, feel free to just express all your opinions you want. Like, mm -hmm. people should be able to just express their yeah. opinions, as you know, obviously, as long as it's not hurting anyone else. But, like, if you say, like, oh, I prefer Marvel over Star Wars or something like that. And, Kind of looking over a ledge right now. <laughs> yeah. But like you should be able to like, you know, feel free to actually like go a deep dive and like why you believe that. Absolutely. And people should be able to willing to like listen and learn. It was like, yeah, like I don't agree with you, but like let me at least hear you out, which is it's a tough thing to do nowadays where it's like if you automatically don't agree with what I agree with, I'm completely blocking you out and ignoring everything you do. It's like Yeah, come and on. with that podcast, I expressed that I, w I thought a lot of what he was saying was interesting and you expressed that you know, you weren't a big fan of his personality, but you were still willing to listen. You still yeah. listened and you still could come to the conclusion like, okay, this person has different feelings and thoughts than me and they're different, but that doesn't mean I can't listen yeah. and, and hear it out because 
even if it's something you disagree with, it's still valuable information to hear that these are what other people are thinking. Exactly. The, you know? the, my, my thing that I mentioned on the podcast was, uh, I think I mentioned a couple of things. I think his personality, he had a very, uh, forward and kind of strong personality, which I see the value in that. And it's just not something that kind of sits right with me. I have a couple uh, people in my life that have that kind of personality mm. and we don't match well because they're very forward and I'm a kind of a more sensitive person. Mm -hmm. So we kind of, you know, we function differently. I see the value in those kind of people. You, you kind of need some of those people that kind of say it to your face. I don't match well with those kind of people. So I, the way Holds Up Jesus was, he kind of seemed like one of those very in-your-face people. Yeah. And I'm like, I just don't match well with that kind yeah. of personality. That makes sense. And so, but the, going back to kind of like hearing other people's opinion, I he said a couple of things in there where I was kind of like, he's like he even mentions that he speaks in very absolutes. Mm -hmm. And a couple of the things he said, he said was in, you know, in absolutes and... I don't know. I, I was kind of just trying to dissect exactly what he was saying. He kind of mm. went into a whole spiritual thing where I was kind of, I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? But then when you like dissect it and I'm like, I was, remember I was at work and I was thinking, I was like, all right, but what does he mean about that? Like what's the, after all this, you know, mm -hmm. this glamour that he puts on all these things where he's going into the spiritual, like, uh, like manifesting these things. And he was saying how he can, he'll think about a person and then he'll think about a halo around and then he believes that he can heal mm -hmm, that person mm -hmm. across the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that does not make it. But then I started thinking, it was like, kind of like, what's at the basis of all that? Mm -hmm. Like, right. Exactly. He's saying all these things with exactly. all these which, which, lights and shows, but which, what's, at, what's at the base of it yeah. is where I was seeing. It was like, he has value Ex in what he's saying. Exactly. Which is how I almost see when, when you find yourself talking to people that believe in a bunch of different religions is that, at the at the top layer, there's a lot of disagreement. Yeah. But when you come down to the foundation, a lot of the beliefs, a lot of the morals, a lot of the concepts come from the same place. Yeah. You know, this believing of achieving a higher self and a connection with a higher power and being one with each other and and us being more than just a physical being, being energy. Like those are the kind of the uh what would you call them? Not the keywords, but like the buzzwords that yeah. you'd find in all these different beliefs. So that's kind of how I view it. Where it's like, okay, maybe we don't leave, we don't meet together at the top layer, but I know how you're getting there. And yeah. like you said, that's where I find the value in the, in those conversations and those opinions because it's like, okay, regardless of where you're taking it with how you see it. I understand where you're coming from, and, yeah. and that's cool to connect on. And I, I you know, I'm kind of going to defend. So I'm a, I'm a Christian. I was born and raised in the church, and to this day, I still go to church. But my mentality has changed a good amount with um, all my years being here. And kind of one of the things I started noticing is that exact thing, where it's like, I kind of get like disappointed, where it's like, oh, this church, like, oh, we believe you are allowed to get tattoos, and then other churches would be like, or like another person would be like. Nah, I don't think the Bible says tattoos are bad. So, and then that becomes literally one church here, one church there. It's like a separate thing mm -hmm. now. And now it's like, oh, now they separated. Or it's like, oh, I, I believe you should be able to drink alcohol. Oh, I don't. All right, mm -hmm. so that's a whole nother. So this a is my device. church. Yep. This is, I'm like, bro, at the end of it, like there's all these nitty rules that, you know, if you're basing it off the Bible, like the Bible says certain things about certain things. Mm -hmm. But other things, it's it's vague about it, or it doesn't it doesn't match up. So it's kind of yeah, like, and that's the tough politics too. About and we don't have to go there, but the tough politics that can happen in religion and in public gatherings is that at the end of the day, you still have to fill the seats, yeah, and you have to pay the bills, and you need the offering money, you need all of that to run everything that you're doing. So at times where the people running the church see the issues with the business side, they can tend to sacrifice certain parts of the beliefs or bend the rules a bit mm -hmm. to make sure that it meets the, um, you know, quota. meets the quota or meets the, the attention or the desire of the community yeah. who's coming here, who's <laughs> attending, who's allowing these lights to be on. So it's like, you know, that shit can be tricky yeah. and sticky and, and maybe not even in the business side, but then people just who are the leaders of these different churches are humans too and experience life and start realizing different things and then start bending 
their beliefs yeah. and then affecting their community. So it's like, I there's think, so many people in the world yeah. and there's so many different experiences. It's me personally in, in this next part of my life of just realizing that at that core, at that foundation, there's a lot that I agree with and that there's just certain and, and everyone's uh, kind of explaining it and yeah. presenting it in a different way. And I find myself then once I realized that I started being more focused on the foundation and getting less concerned with all of the top layers that yeah. everyone else feels like they have an opinion on. Yeah. It's like, what's the root of this pursuit? Is it and what I found it to be now in this part of my life is, is that pursuit of giving my everything to this one life that I have to being the best that I can be to doing best to, to doing best with the time that I have here to give what I can to others to be in pursuit of a elevated version of who I am and those those core things along with some other things are like what I find to be the most important yeah and trying to be connected consciously with something other than me and my surroundings believing that there is a bigger game to all this and not everything is our experience in this moment. Yeah. So, I mean, going, you know, at the foundation, like that's so many different yeah. beliefs. So, yeah. I'm going back to, to what you said before about the, you know, kind of the, the church more or less changing what they say based on, you know, paying bills on anything. I, I will come to the defense on that where it's like, that does end up being like the, the, I honestly, I would say the more the fake churches or the the churches absolutely, that absolutely, I, I've you know because there there are a lot of good churches. I will come to the defense of that because my church, I'm personally at, I I love it there, and I see the there's no fakeness in it. Yeah. What they believe is what they believe, and you know, and it's not even like that they believe in you know a ton of like rough stuff. Like I loved my church because it's very rooted in the book, the Bible, and it's like doesn't he doesn't come the pastor doesn't go much into detail about like you know the nitty gritty. Um, like the details, kind of like the thing. It was like tattoos are bad. No, tattoos are good. Or going into it's rooted in the base of what you know the whole religion was based on, which at the end of the day, kind of ends up being it's love. It's spreading a positive message, mm -hmm. and it's spreading a positive way of living life. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see religion as, and I see that's the value. The value in that. Right. And then going also to the other thing where it's kind of like yeah, at the end of the day, also it's like yeah, it's it's humans. It's no one's perfect. And I like the churches where like they realize it was like, yeah, like we're not here to be perfect. Like, yeah, like y you got a person that like does all these bad things. It's like, yeah, feel free to come in. Like, we're yeah. not going to judge you because of that. Cause yeah, the church but is sometimes that be, can be the cover up as well. Yeah. Is always saying that it's okay not to be, but then that creates the excuse to not to be. Yeah. And then everyone is, you know, it, it kind of, I've seen that happen in churches before. It kind of leads to, than everyone else following suit in those ways, yeah. you know? And then, you know, there's, yeah, there's just so many different beliefs. There's so many different things. And I think at the end of the day, your pursuit should just be in understanding more and yeah. creating more perspective for yourself. So for anyone that's listening, wherever you find that direction in your life, regardless of what it is, you should be pursuing it. Right, not getting caught in just today and your experiences now, and realizing that there's potentially a bigger purpose and there's a bigger life to all this than just this, yeah. the flesh. Right and also, now. you know, growing yourself in emotionally, mentally, yeah. spiritually, growing, just growing all yourself. Because you know, I, I think the the thing that always gets me sad is whenever people are they feel alone or they they feel like lost in something where it's kind of like. Uh, I know I'm I, I'm going back to churches and things like that, but it's kind of like, I you know give it a shot. I, mm -hmm. I'd say to to certain people. I mean, certain people, yeah. If if you don't mess with it, don't mess with it. But certain people, it's like if you've never given it a shot before, like find a good church and give it a shot. Because I you know most of my friends that I've had, no, actually no, not most of my friends, all my friends that I've had for my whole life that have been there with me through thick and thin have been from church mm -hmm. and I've had friends that have gone, you know, in and out of my life and, you know, we're, we don't hang out as much, but it's never been something where I've ended in a rough relationship mm -hmm. where it's been in a fight, you know, 
and it's it just happens to be like the spot where like I've met the most amount of good well, people I willing think, to I think give people me a that have gone to to church and experienced that lifestyle, if they weren't going to learn it somewhere else, that is where you can learn so much value, so much so much, so much of your morals and your core beliefs and things that really help guide you on your journey like all those little practical things yeah um are really it, it's a great guidebook for how to live your life so there are some people that were able to learn those things without having to go to a church or having to have some type of religious background and then there's others that were afforded the opportunity where that's how they got all of their yeah. foundation from so yeah i mean yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, it's mostly just the, like I said, it's like the people that, that they're lost. And yeah. then they, they have like, they feel like they have like no hope or they're just lost. And it's like, just give it a shot because it's better than sitting and just living in the yeah. lostness and be like, oh, like, I don't know. It's like no. you're going into depression, spiraling. And I'm like, pursue life, somewhere pursue else. understanding, yeah. pursue, you know, uh, a feeling of purpose and feeling like every day is for a reason I yeah. think is important because a lot of people too, even without those other beliefs can feel like life is kind of hollow and when it's hollow, you know, that leads to spiraling thoughts. Yeah. So you have to see the value that you offer the people in your life and, and everyone else uh, around you, your family and, and what you can offer yourself. You know, you have an opportunity being alive in the first place. So it's important to make the most out of it. Yeah. And so many people are, are stuck hard to make the decisions that you know you have to make but for the 99 percent of the time it is so worth it when yeah. you make those decisions and uh just getting out of your comfort zone first of all is one of the best things that you can do you know yeah. with a lot of the new stuff that we've been doing on the channel like couch gaming like this podcast like having guests on are in many ways uncomfortable they're not easy things to do and when i when I first felt that feeling of being uncomfortable, I knew I was onto something. Yeah. I knew that it was going to be something that I'd be excited to do because of that challenge, because of that believing like, okay, there's another obstacle and going through obstacles is how you grow. So when an obstacle presents, there's, presents itself to you, it's an opportunity to be better. It's yeah. an opportunity to rise to greater heights and to be where you want to be. Because sometimes... I find myself, and I know people can relate to this, is feeling like you have a purpose, feeling like they're feeling like you have something to live for, something to fight for, a purpose at the end of the day, but not knowing exactly what steps to take to fulfill that destiny. And you just have to be open to the opportunities that life presents itself to you. And those are your opportunities to take a hold of life and do what you have to do. Cause there's so many ways and there's so many times I'm thinking about my future and wanting to be successful, but it's hard to figure out those exact steps to take. Yeah. But then sometimes most of the time life presents you with these certain opportunities where it's like, okay, this is what you asked for. You yeah. wanted to grow. And now there's something in front of you that's uncomfortable giving you the opportunity to do it. Is it really what you want? Are you going to stay in your shit? Or are you going to take that opportunity to be better, to, elevate to the next place that you want to go and i think i, just, I, I thought of a you mentioned that, i thought of like a funny picture the it's like a meme thing i saw i i don't even think i'll be able to find it because i saw it mad long ago but it was just a guy with his like a, a paper and it's a 10-year plan mm -hmm. and it's like year one blank year two <laughs> and then just like all the others blank 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 and at the very end like number 10 it just says and then they'll see <laughs> or then they'll like they'll be proven wrong or whatever and I just laugh so hard at that just because like, yeah, like you got the plan, you got the idea, you know what you want in your life, you know what the end result is. Mm -hmm. And now it's just finding out what that first step is, what mm -hmm. direction you go. And Or even if you don't know what the first step is, is just taking steps. And yeah. along the way, you'll find the path. So many people will be like that book where it's like they have this idea of where they want to go, but they don't know how to get there. So they don't do anything about it. They don't even take the first step. I'm more of the mindset of like, I know where I want to go. Sometimes I don't know how to get there, but that doesn't stop me from walking. Yeah. That doesn't stop me from moving forward. And we kind of mentioned this on another podcast that what we were doing with Eddie, which is just being more in line with your instinct and with 
that voice in your head and of that feeling like you, this is something you should do and, yeah. and following that even if it makes you uncomfortable that's a sign to do it yeah that's a sign to go further in that route so i think yeah i think a lot of people they get into the fear of starting something going in a direction and then when they think they're so far in the path and you just know this is not where i want to be i want to do something completely different mm -hmm. and then they think going back to the beginning is yeah. them like starting from zero and right. I'm like no you didn't start from zero you have more knowledge and you mm -hmm. already feel more comfortable doing something that you're uncomfortable yeah. with because you went through that. Yeah. So even if it was like, yeah, I'm not a hundred percent sure, just do it anyways. Go mm -hmm. chase, like, you know, take that leap of faith because no matter, even if you do end up turning around and be like, this isn't what I want to, this isn't the direction I want to be going. You're at least already moving. So mm -hmm. you're, it's not like you wasted your time. You're still growing. Mm -hmm. Even if it was a complete mistake, you learn from that mistake and you can take that onto the next thing. Versus you just being so overwhelmed by, oh, I don't know what the first step is. I'm mm -hmm. just going to stay still. I'm like, that's when you you get nowhere then. Exactly. And it's easy to stand still. Yeah. Very easy to stand still. And it's important to have people around you too that are going to help try and tell you that, hey, there's an opportunity. You need to be taking your step. And you know, you've been kind of in the same spot for a while. You know? But some people are okay with living a life of, of never changing, but... Those aren't really the people that I like to be surrounded by. Yeah. I like to be surrounded by people that are cho are chasing evolution. Whatever that means for you. I don't know what the fuck that means for you specifically. You know what that means for you. It's just the pursuit of evolution. Yeah. If you're just kind of like, hey, man, I am who I am. and I'm not going to change that for anyone. That kind of person. I mean, that, I mean, that's important to have too, but... I don't know. I feel like life is very complex and you have to be able to bend. Yeah. And you'll get more out of life if you choose to bend, you know? Yeah. If you're in your box too much, it's like there's there's so much opportunity. There's so much life to live that you're not experiencing. Yeah. So. I mean, like I, I mentioned to you before, yeah, like yeah. I going to Texas, like you, he, for those that don't know, Andy called me, uh, I was it like a month before? Mm -hmm. And he pretty much a month before and just be like, are you able to take a week off to for us to it wasn't a week, but it was a couple of days. It was a good amount like of days. Four days. Yeah. Just take a couple of days off to go to Texas. And I told him, it was like, bro, any other day how I was before, I would have just straight up just said no, just because it's so different. It's such a for me, at least it's a leap of faith because mm -hmm. like I'm not used to just going out. Right. Uh I don't travel that much. I'm also not used to just taking time off out of nowhere and things right. like that. But I was like, I'm in a place in my life where I just want to experience new things. I want to try new things. And I was like, yeah, I'll, just well, I'm, like, it's awesome I'll do that it. you're open to that feeling and that opportunity. And it was worth it. Yeah. I, I Cause that's what times. happens when you're willing and you're yeah. like, okay, you know, time to open up to life. Let's experience it. And then you start experiencing all of these things and you realize, Oh wow. Like I should have done that sooner. That would have been so much now I'm excited to do it more. Yeah. You know, I missed out on so much of these opportunities, whether it's in your case traveling or in someone else's case, whatever. Yeah. You know, just. Yeah. I mean, that weekend that was, uh, I, I really did change my mind. Or I was like, I really should be more willing. And just because I took that first step, I was like, yeah, I should be more willing. And to think about it, that we almost did that with UFC 292. Mm -hmm. where we almost didn't go. Cause we almost didn't go. And we wise. bought those tickets in Dallas. Yeah. Because Law was texting, he was like, "The tickets are on sale." By the, we were buying the tickets, and we were thinking about it. He's like, "No, we can't miss this event. We have to be there," and we took that chance. Yeah. And because we took that chance, we experienced one of the greatest nights of our lives. But sometimes it's hard to take those little opportunities where it's like, "Ah, but money, ah, but time, ah, but being out, ah, but being social, ah, but yeah. this crowd of people, ah, but," and you know, those are all just opportunities you're throwing away yeah you could be experiencing some pretty fucking cool things which we did experience some new highs you know like i've had some great i, I don't, i've never had a, a better singular like singular moment of excitement than at ufc 292 yeah. when sean o'malley knocked out aljamain sterling when i looked into my wife's eyes when we, while we were getting married that was one of the best feelings ever, but that was like a drawn out moment. You know, I was feeling that constantly through the night at a high peak. I, I was telling everyone at the wedding, I was, 
felt like I was in the clouds the whole night. But for a singular, shocking, exciting moment, like that only lasted a second, was that knockout. Because when I saw him get buckled and fall to his knees, I got up. Oh, oh shit! <laughs> and we all did. did. Everyone in that, there's no one in the crowd that was seated at that Except moment. Except for the two people, the people behind, behind us behind that us. were rooting for Algermain Sterling. Those fucking oh coaches. Looking for people to cheer with, to be excited with. I look back. Yeah. UFC 292, obviously, in Boston. Um, just as I can paint you guys a picture. Um, we are in a crowd, and we were seeing this before. We went to a restaurant before, and we were just seeing... Uh, um, not Algerbeen, certainly. A uh, Sean O'Malley merch left and right. Everywhere. Everywhere. Everyone Everybody in that crowd, which is because like, I know Andy's going to go into the, the the what happened, but just painting a picture, everyone in that crowd was pretty much rooting for Sean O'Malley. And there were a handful of people yeah. that were brave enough to mm-hmm. rep Algermain Sterling. Less than a handful. It was, yeah. It was if you were listening, insane. If you were listening to the fights, you heard the fuck you. Aljo chants yeah. that were very loud. I actually, we talked about it while we were there. We were like, I wonder what the commentary crew said about Boston. And I don't know if you saw the clip. Yeah, I did. But they did comment on it. And there yeah. was Dana, uh, not Dana White. <laughs> Joe Rogan was like, the people of Boston love to root against someone as much as they love cheering for someone. <laughs> and that's exactly who we are. We're a huge city of competition, not just sports, but competition. Yeah. And uh, if you're on our team, we love you. And if you're not, fuck you. <laughs> yep. To hell with you. We don't get we we don't play that game. Yeah. That's just kind of our, our culture. And that I was lo- a huge I, shock for me when I moved to Atlanta because it's not like that. Really? When I listened to the really? radio for the first time, the sports radio networks after a loss would be like, you know, it's all right. I think you know, you know, I think they'll be better. Like really weird, like excuse making yeah and when you listen to our radio here it's like they're dog shit oh my god <laughs> fucking bunch brutal. of pussies on radio it is yeah brutal. he's a bitch that coach is a bitch like literally <laughs> saying the word bitch yeah. yeah it's it's crazy here but that just shows you the difference in culture so yeah it was a sean o'malley home game yeah in and that stadium he, he's not even from boston no. he just nope. he just he just, just gives like he feels like boston he's like vibes the, yeah the embodiment of Boston, that's what that's kind of what it felt like. He might be, to it be was, honest. It was insane. I've never seen, um, like uh, our crowd hop on somebody's side that hard before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to the extent you know, it wasn't just like uh, it wasn't like sixty forty. Right. No, it was like no, it was like ninety ten. Yeah, and that. and uh, Dana White did comment, or someone asked Dana White about that. Whereas, like, have you ever seen so much support? For a person that's not from that hometown, he was comparing like the only time that's happened was with Ronda Rousey and Conor McGregor, where it's mm-hmm. kind of like they're not from this place, but people are representing that person mm-hmm. so much. I think he might have dropped Brock Lesnar's name too at the end or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, only those few people. And the only other person that got huge chance that were anything in comparison to Sean O'Malley was Chris Weidman. Yeah. The- yeah, that was. Crazy. The stadium was very, very loud for him. And I was like, damn, I didn't know he had a fan base like that. Because I'm looking at my DraftKings. I'm like, I bet against this guy. Yeah. So I'm actually hoping that he loses. <laughs> yeah. And his leg got destroyed. We're going to go through every fight and really go through the commentary. But there's some new stuff that came out in interviews about yeah. that that we definitely have to talk about. Because we're going to go through each. Yeah. We're going to go through the night and we're going to talk about each fight and everything that we experienced. Um I but did. just to get out the other shit that happened throughout the night, because we're kind of the coaches behind us, what the f- audience was like for Sean O'Malley. Um, we were up in the balcony, six, the sixth row up. So I think the total, you know, the back wall of the of the balcony would be like, what, row fucking 40 or something, row 30, maybe? No. So we were still pretty low by the, you know, by the front railing. So we had pretty great seats. We were row six. I and, know that. Yeah. And we were right by the exit where people would walk down and get out. And you guys have to tell this story to them because I didn't see it. I only saw the second person on the ground. <laughs> but to... these two people experienced two or three people falling three. down the stairs. I'm not like falling. Yeah. We're not saying like 
like a slight slip, like you missed the last step. <laughs> I'm telling, I'm saying, like they they came down those stairs with velocity. They were flying down those. I don't know if somebody threw up on the stairs or or dumped something on the stairs or I mean, something. They might have they were, just freshly they waxed were those stairs. Flying, and everyone was slipping at a similar spot, right? Yeah, so it, it was, was probably greasy it was or about wet. The fourth or fifth uh, step up, and the the attendants came out with the mops and and hit it a few times, and people were still slipping after. And, and there was one guy that like. He had he fell down fast and he went right into the seats. <laughs> like oh he, man! He like like bull rushed when the, I'm sitting, the women sitting in the seats. Yeah, I'm so that, in that seats. guy that guy that fell that fell hard. That thing we were talking about. He stayed on the ground for a while. Yeah, yeah I saw him kind of like covering up his face. It like yeah, he and was he, he was on the ground for back. a while. That's the guy that I saw. Yeah, when I was, saw him on the ground, and then I looked at you guys, and you had a reaction. I was like, "What happened?" And you guys saw him actually fucking fall. Yeah, I just saw him on the ground, just face up, like, like looking for help and in pain. Those people were falling more than my phone was, dude. When I have those <laughs> seats, my phone was falling even more. Yeah, I mean, you dropped people. your phone four times. It was pretty fucking not, hilarious. Not even, not even like. I mean, I dropped it like in front of me, but like my like my phone would like go down into the row in front of us, <laughs> like land at people's feet in front of us. Um, he had to at multiple times ask the person in front of him, yeah, to get up to grab Two his or phone. Three times I was like, "Hey, can you uh, do me solid and just grab my phone?" Dude, going back to that person falling, it's one of my biggest fears when I'm at a stadium and I'm like close to the railing on a deep incline. Oh, oh my I'm God. like, all was... it takes is me to slip and I'm dead. We were, we, we talked about that too. It was like, um, what if somebody just went through the glass? Yeah. Like, and and the glass, glass is right not, not that high. No, no it's not. not that high it's at probably, all. I remember it's probably that high on my honeymoon. Uh, Bella and I, when we were in New Orleans, we watched the New Orleans Pelicans play, um, uh, uh, the Dallas Mavericks. And we were in the balcony. We were on the first row. So when we would stand up to cheer, the glass is like at my mid thigh. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. Like I started to feel like I was losing my balance. I was like, that's it. All it takes is this. Yeah. And I'm dead. And it's crazy to think that it was like, yeah, this is also a place where like mad people are drinking. I was yeah. how drinking. Has and I was like, oh my God. Been, how has there not been? 50 deaths a year. Yeah, <laughs> people I, I think because people fall down those stairs. They hit too many chairs and people along the way that it's like hard to get that much momentum. Yeah. Like you just got to go man. straight down like in a ball like Sonic and that just fucking that fly over. came down f- quick. He but he didn't chance. die and he, he stopped at the, the third chance. row. But did you die? No. All right, then shut <laughs> up. Those, get up and just walk out. <laughs> Pussy. If, if those chairs weren't in front of him, he was going over. Like he was flying. Oh, I mean, even man. when I was like, wa- like I went to the bathroom and I was walking back. I'm like walking at the edge. If I fall forward, I'm like, first of all, the the, the top of the seats are right where my feet are at. So because it's you know staggered, yeah. so I was like, if I fall forward, like I'm dead. first of all, I'm hitting my face on the glass probably. Or something. Dead, dead. It's- and our seats were were pretty great, man. Like I, I'm really happy with them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ledge, you actually had a friend that was at the fights. And they paid six hundred for their seats, and we went over to their seats. Yeah. Now we didn't get to see during fights what that, you know, what those seats look like. But even then, you know, to save on two hundred bucks in comparison to their tickets, like I'm still really happy with the angle yeah. that we had. And we talked about it during the fights, but I was, and you were also, and I think Ledge was. I didn't. I actually didn't even ask you, but you can chime in that I made a commitment to not look at the TV. The screen yeah, and the yeah. top middle. Like I was looking straight at the fights. Yeah. The only time I would look up at the screen was like grappling. if they were on the ground yeah. and they were grappling. Yeah. To get That's like a better view of the hands and, and what the movements are happening. But if it was stand up, I'm watching. Yeah. And thank God we caught all of I caught everything as far as knockouts. Like I didn't miss Aljo knockout. I saw that happen, which is so rewarding to yeah. say. Yeah, surreal. And and I think it goes to say, because we were talking about this too, is, you know, in the early prelims, 
everyone was mad loud and excited for every fight. The energy was insane. Energy was top tier. There were chants. The whole crowd was in sync. Yeah. And once it got to the main card, there was never one consistent chant. Yeah. It was like one would start and then it would die and then another one would kind of start and it would die. And I think it was what we were talking about was the focus that people had yeah. during the fights. Like people were locked in. I was locked yeah. in. I'm just staring at the fights, making a little commentary to you. We talked about the people that were behind us that were cheering for Aljo. Yeah. The whole prelim, they're like out loud coaching the fighters yeah. the whole fight yeah. loud as switch fuck left. too switch left switch yeah left. I, I, overhand. I knew doing? immediately like they started talking i was like oh these guys are getting on my nerves because we're we're doing something similar where but it's kind of like, loud we're, no 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 but we're also not coaching we're commentating yeah we're like we're sitting next to each other and then he'll throw a head kick and we're like oh damn that was a nice head kick yeah. or he'll be doing something it was like oh bro like like, oh, he's hitting that leg a lot, you know? Yeah. We're talking about, like, oh, stuff that he's doing. The difference between that and the people behind us was that there's literally, like, jab, jack, hook. Come yeah. on, jab, jack, hook. Come on. And then there's one time where he was like, Chris. Chris, because there's Chris Wadman. And he was like, Chris. 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 And I'm like, do you think Chris is going to hear you? Like, I want to <laughs> turn around, bro. Like, what are you talking about, yeah. bro? Like, Listen, I, eventually they got annoying. At first, though, I fucked with it heavy. Yeah. Because I liked the environment that we were in where people were kind of talking about the fights and like super invested. Yeah. Because if you go to like a, a Celtics game or a Pats game, it's really just cel celebrating. In this one, not only was it them, but you could hear little bickers around of like different opinions during the fight. Yeah. And, yeah. And that was actually a really, really cool energy to feel. But once the main card started, we didn't hear from them like, yeah, Maybe they, two they or three in. times. Yeah, they, and that just showed that everyone, the real fights are on. Yeah, everyone's yeah. quiet. Not even talking, not Actually, even blinking. Not even the main event. Not even the main events because I, I, I noticed. I think it went and switched to the prelims or like the late prelims. Well, I was going to say, like, I noticed it's like, I thought there was going to be cheering and chanting the whole time. And it was interesting to see it. It was like, I, I even noticed from the very first fight, like the very first fight, the second the fight started, it just went quiet, yep. and people are just watching. Yeah, I didn't chance here and there, but then you once just the chance like dies murmuring. down, yeah, it's murmuring. But then everyone, I love that. Me too. It was like, bro, people are locked in, and people are appreciating this as much as I am. Yes, and there was a lot of wrestling on the card, and there was a lot of grappling on the ground, and there was no booze. It was just everyone was locked in and there's, really appreciating. There's like it. one Even guy specifically that yeah. was booing. Yeah, but like no even one, then, no it, one, it was no for one like helped. five seconds and no one joined in. Yeah, so it was just so cool to be there in sync with everyone, feeling the same thing, analyzing similarly. Uh, especially being a young UFC fight fan, getting to be in an arena full of people that are enjoying the sport as much as I am and talking about it was just like, oh shit, like this is kind of cool. Like I feel like a part of the of the club and. Um, Man, a lot of passionate fans yeah. there. A, a lot of great merch. Yeah. A lot of, we saw, you know, shirts from UFC 282, 281, I think. Yeah. Uh, shout out to the shirt that you got. That thing's sexy. Uh, you can't see the back, but it basically shows the main poster yeah. of the fight. Um, but man. It was cool. Some people had some pretty L takes, though. I mean, at least from Chris Weidman, Chris Weidman mm -hmm. the people that were sitting behind us, and I think a couple of other people, they're all like, Oh yeah, Chris got it easily. Like, the, like three rounds to him, and we yeah. all three of us were like, "No, we yeah. were like, what are like, you did, smoking? Did we see the same fight? What are you talking about? Chris kind of got his ass whooped, yeah. and then like Weidman didn't have a leg. Yeah, <laughs> and, and when they announced that he lost, be, I oh, like literally went wrong. like this. Yeah, I saw because I was like, obviously, bro, he yeah. won, and that made me win money. Yeah. That was the only. That was the only one where it was kind of like we were all like kind of was like yeah we kind of we all bet Tavares uh, Tavares Tavares against uh, Weidman. But I was gonna comment. I was like I did like how at least ninety percent of the night everyone was cheering for the exact same people. Even in like in the prelims, like one of the very first fights, it was uh, Karina Silva, yep. Natalia Silva. Everyone was cheering for Silva. Yeah, there was a Silva chant. Yeah, yeah. we're just like dude, these are like. 
early prelims. It was the first fight of the night. And people were all cheering for the person and they ended up winning. Yeah. But it was cool. It was like, man, like I'm also cheering for the rooting the, for this person. Everyone's on the same page. That was one thing I was kind of worried about where it's kind of like, if I'm going to be chanting for someone and there's going to be like one person behind mm. me, just mm. start talking shit at me like mid fight. I'm like, yeah, Bro. well, I think what we noticed is that was, that was probably dictated by, a lot of the bets that people were making yeah. as well. And we were betting with the favorites for most of the bets that we had. So I think that ten leg. That kind of, exactly. That kind of goes with like, okay, it, it, betting kind of puts everyone together because most people are betting for the same person and playing the odds and stuff like that. And even going back to the energy that you're talking about for the prelims, going back to when we were walking in, doors opened at what time? Remind me? Six. Six uh, o'clock, five thirty. Five thirty, five thirty. Five thirty, and then we they let people into their seats. Uh, five forty-five, five fifty. So we're there at five thirty, and there's a line, and there's chance happening. Yeah. So that Sean already O'Malley. showed you, like, okay, okay. You know, I've been to the Garden early, before regular season games. Same thing with the Bruins. Uh, I haven't been to a playoff game there, but. I imagine that's when that energy kind of feels similar to UFC, but just feeling that unified energy from the jump, seeing all the merch, like you said, everyone wearing green wing wigs for Sean, wearing his pink and green uh, merch that he it's has. A sea of pink, bro. Sea of pink. And uh, man, what a great night for energy, for entertainment. Peak moment of my life, for sure. Another thing that was super dope that I want to make sure I mention, because I know if you've never been to a UFC event live, you don't know this exists, but during the takedowns, you could hear the thud from the canvas, and you could tell that there was a microphone underneath it. Yeah, and it, it like would a, hit the subwoofers yeah, every time like they would land on mic. the canvas. It was like a boom. Yeah, that yeah. echoed throughout the stadium, and that was so fucking satisfying. It made the it made the takedowns feel even cooler. Yeah, and yeah. feel even more exciting to support when it happened. So I thought. That that as a production choice was so intelligent yeah. to kind of like give the live audience that extra thing to really see the impact of that position that just happened. Yeah. The lighting too as well, the small details, yeah. man. And the lighting that progressed throughout the night. I don't know if I yeah. mentioned this to you, but you mentioned it to me. how it was progressing throughout the night. Like the early prelims get only certain lights. They get only certain... You know, shots up on the screen. There's yeah. only certain things that happen. Yeah. And then as the prelims come, we get to see new lights. You know, the camera's doing new things. And then once you get to the main card, it's like they bust out all yeah. the fucking best shit. They hit us with all these different cool... I, I was noticing the graphics. When they, they graphics put the, the, per, the person's name, like, in the prelims, it's all very basic stuff. But then, like, when it starts hitting, like, uh, some of the later on, mm-hmm. they're like, the graphics start changing. They get different fonts, like Al mm-hmm. Sterling and Sean O'Malley. They had their names and their nicknames in certain mm-hmm. fonts. Yep. Yep. They had backgrounds to yep. it. They had a whole environment yep. pretty much around their name. And, and because they were a championship fight, one of the two championship fights that night, it was the only time where the stadium would get completely dark, then turn on, and then the TV would stay off as yeah. their intro song is playing and as there's a light show going on in the stadium. Yep. It only happened for those two championship fights. And that was just like another thing. Like, oh, way to like help the the people that are experiencing this like to help take that to the next level yeah yeah because you could go there just to enjoy a fight and have a great time but for them to do those little details and to really continue increasing what feels like are the stakes of the fights like these are getting harder there's more on the line as we're going in, on in the night and for you to feel that because you could watch how many how many fucking fights did we watch 10 fights Maybe uh, so. Well, we can count right maybe here. ten or twelve One, fights. Two, three, Even on uh, Wei Lee and six, Lamos, seven. the flags were on the canvas, and it, it was such a twelve cool fights. Little ball fights. Yeah. So you know, if, if they didn't take those decisions on production, the night could get super boring. Yeah. By the end of it. Yeah. I mean, what time did? Sugar Sean and Aljamain come out uh, twelve forty five. Like, yeah, it was twelve like thirty twelve. <laughs> we, we got home around two thirty in the yeah. morning. Yeah, so. I mean we were we were in like a, the only time I remember looking at the clock is when we were in the car driving home, and that was one forty. Yeah, same. Yeah, I was like, whoa. Yeah, I was like, oh, damn, we're late. <laughs> and I felt like a little bit tired, but I was locked in, man, because the biggest fight of the night happens right at the t- the point that you're supposed to be the most yeah. tired, so you're just lit. 
and our explosion of energy after he won. I mean, we're going to get into I mean, that. Oh, but holy and, and shit. Speaking of energy and like getting that emotion and kind of like the production wise, um, I just got to say Cheeto Vera's walkout song. Oh my God. One of the best walkouts of holy the night. Holy crap. The bass bumping on that and then just that reggae vibe. And him just running, kind of like doing that, those hops, oh high five. The vibe was the best walkout vibe. I of the felt night. his yeah. energy, and I'm like, bro, it, I hope I can, can we feel get a, something like that. Can we get a song shout out? I know it's DJ Khaled. What's the name of the song? Um, he came out uh, fight ready too. He didn't come out with like they usually come out with the sweater on and and shoes and pants. He came out no shoes, no shirt in his fight trunks. Ready to go. Ready to go. Uh, the and song it, is uh, Where You Come From by DJ Khaled. What album is it off of? Is it Assad? I think. Um, but yeah, from the angle that we had, we could see Khaled the Khaled? fighters before. Uh, oh yeah, from Khaled Khaled. Yeah, banger. But from the, the position that we had with our seats, we could see the fighters right at the edge of the inside of the tunnel, getting ready to walk out and just looking at the screen and waiting for their cue. And that was pretty cool. You know, you yeah. got to see what they were doing and we got to see that Cheeto Vera wasn't wearing anything. We're like, yo, look, look, look. You know, as the other fighters still doing their walk-in. So that was super dope, man. There there was so much to that event that was amazing. I remember before we go into each individual fight, yeah, you know, getting home that night was like hard to process yeah. everything that we experienced. And on top of getting one of the most peak sports moments in UFC history right in front of our eyes was like, holy shit, yeah. that just happened. And it didn't feel... And that's it, a dope feeling, I've man. watched so many UFC events, and I don't know if it's just because um, we were live, maybe we were kind of getting that bias where like, it felt different though. It felt like the Boston energy is different from these other places because even some fr certain fighters, they were like talking to the crowd way more and they were way more appreciative of the crowd. And all the winners, they were just talking about like that energy Boston gave them. It's like, yeah, I don't know if it's just because just we're biased because we were there, but like honestly, like it looked and kind of felt different from other UFC mm -hmm. events. Yeah. It was uh, it was fantastic. I Dana said in the press conference afterwards that he definitely is planning on going back to Boston soon. It so next year we're gonna drop probably six hundred. I want to stay on the balcony, but I want to do the first row in the middle. Really? Okay. okay. I'm down. That's what that. I want. That might be like eight hundred to be honest. But just start saving now, we'll, okay, we'll guys? Start saving now. I'm good, man. I was ready to ball out. And uh, we just need a good card. I know. And you know what I was thinking when I was there too? I was like, you know what makes this event even more special is that we have, we have international fighters. Like this isn't, this isn't a home event. Yeah. And these events happen all across. Yeah, there were the no... country. You know, and then I started to think like, man, what if you? What if your dream was to see Israel Adesanya? You know, like you would have to, for the most part, either go to MSG or like go fight a fly to Vegas or Sydney and watch him fight there, and that made being in the stadium feel like even a bigger moment. Like this isn't watching the Boston Celtics, this isn't the New England Patriots. Like this is the UFC, an international fight company. Yeah, yeah. there were actually no fighters from Boston on that card. Yeah, yeah. which was crazy. Yeah, which was crazy. Right? But supposedly, I heard in the press conference after that. Um, the card was kind of already made and then Boston just was the location to do it. So yeah. they couldn't really like reformat the card to include. It's fine by me. Which is unfortunate, okay. but you know, maybe in the in the negotiations, Boston just took too long to fucking say yes or something. So who knows? Yeah. Um, something Boston would do. Yeah, because you know, that's something that the UFC is very aware of. Like they go to certain uh, countries, certain states, and they try to have those fighters that are from there on that card because the, ener the, the energy of the of the arena really pushes to that one. There was actually a really funny moment during the fight, during one of the fights where there was two American fighters, and the crowd started chanting yeah. USA. <laughs> and I started laughing. <laughs> I was like, they're both from the United <laughs> States. Yeah. They just showed the flag. There's not really competition here. <laughs> and then the guy in front of us looks back, and he's like laughing yeah. and shaking his head. I think they were going against the other guy, because they're cheering for one guy. And then they're like, USA, USA. And then I was kind of like, the dude's from Las Vegas. What are you talking about? 
<laughs> that was fucking. Oh, hilarious. was it? Uh, hold on, let me check. But I think, I it think... Was Brad. Was it Brad? I was gonna say. I think, I think it was Tavares it was Chris and Wyman. Wideman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they yeah. were kind of like Brad Tavares. They're they're chanting uh, <laughs> USA for Chris Weidman. They're like USA, USA. And I was like, Bro, I'm pretty sure this dude's from like Las Vegas. Dude, what are you talking about? Absolutely <laughs> fucking hilarious. Okay, before we get into this, last thing I'll say is the theme song that comes up before every fight. Mm. You know what I'm talking about? You sit on TV too. Yeah, that was such a dope moment being in the stands because oh. the whole stadium was shut off and the theme would happen. You're like, okay, yeah. fight time. Yeah. And even if you went to go get a drink or go to the bathroom, like that sound was like the whole night. You could just, okay, here we go. Now they're going to show the graphics. They're going to walk out the fighters. It was just really cool. Before we move on, can I just throw in yeah. um, how incredible it is to hear Bruce Buffer live? I mean, it, like hearing it on TV is one thing, but hearing him and watching him, like just watching him warm up, Oh my like God. like the fights haven't even started. Not like not a single fighter has walked out yet, and he's r- next to the octagon, jumping up and down, like dancing, like just getting pumped, doing stretches, stretches. doing squats, he's doing stretches he's... to announce. I mean, this guy, I, <laughs> like, it's insane. And just hearing him, hearing him live is such a different experience. And yeah, he, he's so, he's so good at his craft. I knew that he did that, and I knew that he would really, he does his warm-ups, and he takes it super serious. So I was expecting to see it, but getting to see it and seeing so much of it just gives you the appreciation for someone that, you know, takes care of and treats their craft in that way, you know, that they really have that excitement and passion for it. Even if it's something as simple as just announcing, he's doing it so seriously. But being in an environment with fighters who are fighting, you know, like this is elite competition, this is life and your health on the line so i think he feels like oh shit like i'm announcing warriors yeah like, this isn't like whatever so he he locks into their mind stay and like you know fucking like warming up and like shaking his arms like yeah, yeah. I, I love that I, I, he pretends like he's a fighter i mean i love in that. a way he does kind of affect because like just imagine real quick if bruce buffer goes to announce you and he's just low energy how are you going to feel like mm-hmm. you're about to you hop in a fight and he's low energy? And I was like, you might start like start second guessing some stuff. And like, if he gives you that energy, he's hyping these two fighters mm-hmm. so we can get a show as well. He's, it's he's so true. pumping them up so he can like kind of like winding these two characters up and then just leaving, let them have it. He needs to do that. That's a really great point, man. That's a really great point. And aside from the uh, it's time on the main event, Every single fight he announces is just about the same energy level mm-hmm. consistently yeah. throughout the night from early prelims to mm-hmm. to early on the main card. But I love what event. he does with his voice depending on what part of the night that we're in. If we're yeah, in the early course, prelims, like he, he doesn't go 10 volume and he doesn't do like certain inflections with his voice. Yeah. And he builds it up the whole night and it gets bigger and bigger along with the production, along with the level of competition. It's, it's a great event. I think that honestly, it's the best live event I've ever been to in Agreed. my life. Oh, yeah. Agreed. I've been All to sports, so many music. Games. I've been to J. Cole 2014 Four Hills Drive Tour. This was a peak live anything, live entertainment moment of my life. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Easy money. Okay. Let's go into each one of these fights. Let's go, baby. So, do you want to start? Um... On the let's do prelims. Um, yeah, I was gonna say that. Yeah. The prelims we don't need to show the screen, right? We can just talk about it. We had the ultimate. Like, we fighter. could do a picture in picture. So yeah, you just make a full screen. We had the ultimate fighter finale. Um, so that was pretty. I mean, I'm kind of upset Connor wasn't there. Yeah, but that. I I actually listened to. Um, he released. You know how you can do like those voice message things on on X. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you like that? Yeah, that was hard to say. Yeah, I really sure. wanted to say AK Twitter, but I just did, and that felt much better. Um, okay. He released a long voice note talking about the night, and basically he said that he was inspired after Brad Katona's victory, his uh, the fighter from his camp, the Ultimate Fighter finale against Cody Gibson. 
he said that his speech afterwards of like getting up the next morning, getting back to work and watching the tape inspired him to get to the get in the gym and keep working and all that. Wow. So that was his reason. I'm pretty and sure. And he said he didn't watch. I don't think he saw Aljamain uh, Sean's um, knockout until the next morning because yeah. he went to bed early. Like he was doing all that stuff. So. Honestly, I'd rather that than Connor showing up and like putting on a show. Like, that's good, valid. bro. Be in the fucking gym. That's what we aware. want from you. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. So that's valid. yeah. I heard it. I heard yeah, it this I'll, morning. I'll take that back then. Yeah, but I mean, we were feeling that all night. We we're like, where the fuck is Connor, bro? Like, yeah. your your fighter is here. He's from. Uh, he fights out of his gym. Like they've been working together. They're opposite teams also, on the Ultimate Ian Fighter Gary's show until the well. later rounds. Ian Gary. The Irish, I mean, it's, it just felt like it was fate for him to show up. And I think according to that voice message, it seemed like he was going to. Yeah. And then... I mean, he posted something on his on his Instagram saying, like, talking about Boston. And he was like, uh, this day, like, this couple of years ago, like, I was heading to Boston and everything to do this. And he was like... Because really, to think about it, <clears throat> if he does commit to going, then he's up until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. He's drinking, he's eating, and... If you're a fighter trying to be a champion, you're going to bed early, you're waking up early, you're hitting the gym, you're eating clean, you're cutting weight, like all of that shit. I mean, you're not really cutting weight yet, you're, but you're getting in shape. You're, yeah. you're getting into that range that you want to be in, you know? Um, so interesting. And I, and I prefer that for Connor. So good for him. So let's go through this card. So is that the first one? Brad Katona versus Cody Gibson? Yes. Yep. I'm pretty sure they're both getting a contract. They are. Yeah. yeah. I saw that it this was morning. A great fight. Great fight. Um, awesome to watch live, man. These guys were in the middle just dogging it out. Yeah. And honestly, the next fight, which is still the ultimate fighter fight, Kurt Hollibaugh versus Austin Hubbard, even took it to the next level because these motherfuckers were swinging just like they were. But the damage, I mean, Kurt and Austin were like heads rocking back and huge overhand. Yeah. Oh man. It was a, it was it was a brawl. A great finale for that. I, I like we said last week. I I haven't seen any of the episodes. Uh, I haven't really been interested in it. But watching these four fighters was incredible. Yeah. And it kind of made me want to watch it. You should. It was good. You know, I, I kind of critiqued it a little bit, I think, an episode or two ago, just talking about, like, the format of it. Yeah. Uh, not my favorite. I kind of want it to be more about fighting and seeing, like, the in the inner depths of, of the coaching and stuff like that, but whatever. Not a more of a drama thing. Yeah, exactly. Like I don't need as much of the TV backstory, show. the reality TV show, the conversations in the house. You know what I also thought was very confusing that I wanted to mention on that podcast that I forgot? was I didn't like the format. I didn't like how they explained the format as it went on. It was confusing. It was like, okay, how does this bracket work? If you lost, then why are you still in the house? And then what's like, it It just felt like they didn't really show it that well. Didn't it switch? Don't you switch teams if you lose or something like that? No, no, oh. no. But then, but then Connor, lost, their team lost like fucking eight straight or something. So then, when it came down to the end, the numbers were the odd. The, the numbers weren't equal. So then they had to s combine teams and switch teams. It was just like it was mad weird. I just feel like they didn't explain it from the jump, and yeah. that made the show kind of hard to watch because you're like, who's fighting who? Who's still in the house? Like you kind of forget. Yeah, but they did switch teams, right? There were like some at one point, yeah. Oh, okay. So Brad was on Chandler's team the whole time yeah. with Cody Gibson, but his background is actually training with Connor. And Connor's coach is his head coach, in like in real life. So once it got to a certain point of the season where they had to kind of switch teams to like even out the bracket, he was like, I want to go back to my coach. Like, I'm, okay. I'm on the ultimate fighter. My coach is on the other team. Like, I, I wish I could be with my coach. So he did switch uh, and ended up being on Connor's side. So technically Connor's, Connor's team won, but that's not Connor's fighter. Yeah. He was with the other team the, the whole season, so. Anyways, and we saw Michael Chandler there. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. I shot Chandler and we saw Pereira there. Yep. Uh, and we... Uh, Stone Cold. Cody. So. No, kind of Cody. No. Fucking, fucking... Bilal. Sanhagen. Oh, yeah. Sanhagen was there. But we were... Bilal. The yeah. closest words to Bilal. We, we literally could have, if we wanted to... Could have touched just them. Just touched yeah. them. Could have rubbed his back. Yeah. 
So oh, DC, guy. Joe. I mean, you could, you could see everyone from down there. Uh, okay, next fight. Uh, Gregory Rodriguez versus Dennis. We knew Gregory would win this fight, and guess what? He got an early knockout. Dominant and it was fashion. a weird knockout. Like, you couldn't really tell what exactly hurt him, but he kind of just, like, went down mad fast and easy. Like, that fight was... Yeah, I think I think Gregory took him down, and then he elbowed him. And there's like elbows on ground him, and he elbowed him in the head, and I think he went out for a second. I want to say Dennis he somehow. Yeah, KO. Somehow, he somehow ended up like sitting on his arms. Yeah. So he so um, Dennis couldn't get out or do anything or mm -hmm. defend himself, and I think I think maybe he got an arm out and put it over his head, but Gregory just laid elbows down on his head against the mat. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think it was like the second or third one where he was, he went out, he went to sleep. Yeah. And I mean, it was, it was a brutal knock. I mean, round one, a minute 43 left. Like, yeah, that, that was a quick fight. I mean, that the second the went, fight of the night, it went to the yeah. ground. Gregory's jujitsu. I, I commented about him the way he got his leg over and to got into the mount position. Mm -hmm. so it was so smooth. smooth. Mm -hmm. It was Seamless. so smooth. Made yeah. it look easy. Yeah. The second he did that, I'm like, oh, Greg won. There's no nice. shot. There's no oh, shot. Oh, we also have to talk about our records, by the way. We'll, we'll, we'll wait until we get to the main we'll card. Yeah, we'll yeah. Okay, so Chris Weidman versus Brad Tavares. We talked about this a little bit. Chris Weidman was definitely... Electric fight. ...had the home field advantage. Uh, everyone in the crowd was cheering for him. Yeah. But he got fucking destroyed. Leg chopped off. Leg chopped off after coming back from a broken leg injury where he hasn't fought in how many years was it two years or some shit like that he's been in rehab and then brad Tavares out the gate just sends leg kicks to the fucking moon and then i heard in an interview today that chris weidman afterwards was saying how he was shocked that Tavares was hitting his legs <laughs> I, mean, I was like bro you you were expecting pity empathy you, what are you talking about? You're in the cage and you're not. He was like, I was actually surprised. Like, I was like, wow, like you would really do that, dude. He said it multiple times. I was like, oh shit, like you're being serious. I was like, first of all, you, you if didn't you're think hopping you'd back, your leg, the, are you fucking dumb? If you're hopping back in a cage, it can be kind of assumed. Oh, you're back to a hundred percent. Yeah, you're you think I give a fuck about you? Yeah, I'm game. trying to fair game. Have a career. This is my my job is to whoop your ass, bro. So I thought that was mad weird. And uh, I'm glad Dana White in the press conference said, retire. Yeah. Just retire. We listened to it in the car on the way back. Yeah. Just retire. It was funny. <laughs> like he was laughing. Say, yeah. yeah. He, please retire. Just retire, man. I mean, uh, he, I think it. First uh, fight was in 2011. Chris Weidman. This is his first fight. Wow. 2011. And he's been fighting a lot every wow. single year. And then uh, 2021 was his last fight where he broke his leg. Mm -hmm. So he's, yeah, two For years. Two years. Yeah, and Brad Tavares was the person that we picked, even though it doesn't go on our record because it's just prelims. But we did say, oh, look, he's got the Hawaiian tattoos. We found out he is Hawaiian. So we were like, you know, sending our love to Hawaii. We knew he would come fucking ready to fight. And he did. He started getting tired, but it was a great fight and a good dub. Chris yeah. Weidman, retire. All right, on to the next fight. The first of the main card, Marlon Vera, aka Cheeto versus Pedro Munoz. This was the only fight of the night that afterwards I was wrong about the outcome. This whole fight, from where we were, I could not see how Cheeto was winning. Yeah. And when he won, and how he, their reactions were so, like, obviously Cheeto won. Like, Cheeto knew he won. Pedro looked like, oh, I lost. I was surprised. I was like, whoa. Like, I, I definitely missed that one. Yeah. Uh, I think we all did. It, yeah, we all did. And even compared to like all night, the people behind us that were coaching, they were wrong all night. We were right all night yeah. with everything that we were saying, how the rounds were going. There were some scorecards that were pretty shocking, um, but nothing egregious. There was some that was like, "What? How would you give that guy the first round?" It was shocking. But yeah, we'll get to we'll get yeah. to the fight where that happened. But this was the only one that I was like, "Really, Cheeto won?" And then you could look at their faces, and you're like, "Yeah, I see the damage for sure." But from where we were, I thought his leg was getting chopped up. He was getting hit with the jab all night. So 
that is a fight I still have to rewatch, and I'm looking forward to rewatching it. Yeah, the I only one I rewatched so far was the Sean O'Malley one. Yeah, I definitely want to rewatch this one as well because same thing. At least when I was looking at it, I'm like, I there's a couple rounds in there. Where I was like, God, oh, that can be pretty up in the air. But there, are, I think round two or round three it was one of those where I was kind of like, that's kind of a bit clearly that was Pedro, mm-hmm. and then for it to just be unanimous decision for for Cheeto, I was kind of like, oh. That did kind of catch me off guard as well. Yeah. Yeah, I have the uh, the scorecards for that fight. Tell me. Um, so um, we have two scorecards that were 30-27 in Cheeto's favor. That's and, insane. And I don't know how you I don't know how you give Cheeto every round. That's insane. One judge uh, gave 29-28 Cheeto. I got to watch that fight so back. So it's a unanimous yeah. decision on Cheeto and decisive for two of those judges. But I, I think we were all on the same page where we didn't think Cheeto. From was. where we were, you couldn't tell. No. And, you know, I saw a cap- I saw someone tweet this uh, today. And I thought it was perfect to describe what we experienced, which is like Cheeto fights in such a boring way where sometimes it's hard to see how he's winning. Yeah. <laughs> like, you, it's hard to tell. Like, wait, is it? I can't, I can't tell. Yeah. And I think that was the case. It was just from where we were and his style, he just doesn't seem as active. He doesn't seem as forward pressing. He's always in the pocket, but he's not really swinging. He's more of like a counter puncher. So it's like hard to tell when he's landing, but uh, you know, apparently, uh, not apparently, but obviously Pedro was definitely very bruised in the face and Cheeto looked like he didn't even fight. So, I mean, that should probably tell you the whole story. So we all picked Cheeto, right? Uh, yes, yeah, I did. I got to double check and see which what were the my choices last podcast. I don't remember. Oh shit! I know for a fact we all did Cheeto. Okay, all right. we trust him. Next, thanks. Black Shear versus Bautista. This was a really really fun fight. Yeah, yeah. Because we found out that Black Shear in the stadium, we found out that Black Shear was fighting his second fight in seven days. He fought last Saturday, which means he made back to back weight cuts and was about to try and make a statement. You know, you back to back wins. The last one was a choke. What a statement that would have made. That'd be huge. You get you get sent right to like top fifteen probably. Probably. So, uh, what a fantastic fight. It's a good fight. What a fantastic fight. Um, I think it was pretty, I want to say Mario did win pretty yeah. decisively as well. Black but, Shear won a round. Yeah. I forget which round it was, maybe the second round. But uh close fight. Yeah. I was actually going to say, I pretty like, you know, seen at, at least towards the end, I was like, yeah, Mario definitely won that one. Mm-hmm. And, but Black Shear did it. Great job. Yeah, and he I would say tough. the crowd was mostly on Blackshear's side. Oh, for sure, for yeah. For sure. How can you not? Yeah. I mean, you want him to be win one week and then next week get that same high of winning again, mm-hmm. bro? Like, of course, who wouldn't want that for the guy? Absolutely. All right, next fight? We, um, I'm trying to remember. Was this the fight where they ended up, and like the very last, they were just swinging? There's one fight where no. Like, no. there's a couple no. ten no. seconds it was left. A no, limb, I think no. Oh, it was uh, Petrosky and and Gerald. Um, mm, that's sure. what it was. Yeah, that's the one. I just want to. That, that, that was, was a, shout, shout out. That was to the those fight guys. of the night for me. Yeah, yeah those that guys was, stood there in the middle and just started wailing on each other. It was very similar to Max Holloway's fight where he kind of just points at the thing and he was like, "All right," and then they just mm-hmm. start swinging. Mm-hmm. Very same vibe. They were just swinging, no blocking, just swinging. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the fight of the night for me, for sure, as far as like back and forth and and the entertainment of it all, you know, the swings and this guy's landing, now this guy's landing and yeah, knockdowns, take down attempts, takedowns, block, the, the, the everything. Change. It had everything you know Incredible there's some fight. singular performances that we'll get to that were obviously outstanding like Ian Gary like Zhang Wei Li like Sean but both sides like an entertaining fight that one was definitely the fight of the for night sure. for me for sure uh going on to Neil Magny versus Gary the first time Gary landed that leg kick was fucking shocking yeah we saw this dude leg fly from where we were sitting yeah we were first like, round you could hear that shit from. There were certain kicks throughout the night that you could actually hear. Yeah, yeah, which was insane. Was like, body oh, kicks, yeah, I heard them. Body kicks, I was able to hear all the way on top in the balcony. I'm like, that must have hurt because yeah. I'm hearing it. It was definitely mic'd for sure, but 
there was ones that you could hear that were louder than others. Yeah. Like when a guy really connected, you could tell he connected. Like it, it came through on the microphone. Yeah. And Ian Gary's leg kicks to Neil Magny's were insane. Like I'm talking about like a leg kick where this dude's leg flew out underneath him and he was on his ass. Yeah. Like dude could chop trees times. with his legs. Yeah. It was it was so animated. There was one point I I turned to to Andy and I was like he must be faking it so they could go on the ground. <laughs> yeah, like, you did say that. Uh, it was it was so brutally animated where he just kicked his leg and then he was just yeah. on his ass. Yeah. And that was it. And it, every time he kicked, it was a reaction. Yeah. There wasn't one kick where he didn't react. But the truth is, is that Ian Gary is just that powerful, that talented, and that levels above Neil Magny because he made him look like uh, he was bullying a kid. Yeah, behind the school, yeah. like it was that bad. And Neil, Magny you know, like good. telling him to come up, flipping him off. He never, Neil never landed anything on Gary. Like it was just a clinic. In in Neil Magny's defense, it was short notice. He did come yeah. in short notice. So, nah, but you, it's like we're talking about. You accept the fight. You yeah. accept the fight. Yeah. No and Neil Magny is not like a nobody as well. Like I, even they know I mentioned Neil Magny is is a veteran. He's he's really good at fighting. Mm -hmm. He just went against a person that is. On another level right yeah. now. So yeah. he made him look like... Yeah, and he called out Wonderboy Thompson, but I hear... Immediately the, turned down. Immediately turned like down. Like before we even got into the car. Which is very, very interesting. Could we actually I look... That. Can we look at the welterweight division rankings, please? Yeah. Because if he can't fight Wonderboy, and he's trying to get into the top 15... Who's next? Who's the fight? Because I see Bo Nickel, I see Ian Gary, I see these guys trying to take the same route that people like Al Jermaine just took. No, not Al Jermaine, I'm sorry. Sugar Sean O'Malley took. Yeah. Which is like this slow climb, pick the right fights, and when it's time to take on a top 10 guy and you feel like, you know, it's, it's a good move, you take it. But you have to be super tactical, you know? Kevin Holland, Sean Brady, Neil Thompson. So he he's eight. trying to go top like eight. So oh shit, Neil Magny is actually above Ian Gary. I actually was not aware of that, but yeah, Neil Magny is eleven. Uh, Gary's eight thirteen. So I wonder if that changes. So if he's trying to jump down as Thompson, Thompson's he's seven. either gonna take like a uh vincent luke sean brady type guy or he's gonna have to try and jump to like a, a gilbert burns we'll see but i don't think he's gonna be able to get in the top five without beating some of these guys no, in the no. i mean neil brady need, luke one of those guys he has to fight even holland i think he would even need to go holland's an interesting fight it is an interesting fight Ian gary but i think him. Ian gary probably whoops his ass really I th I like Kevin Holland a lot. I really do. But it, I'm trying to be less biased when I come to my picks nowadays. I'm literally just trying to base it off of, like, fighting styles. And, and the, you know, that was the shocking thing about the Aljo and Sugar thing is that I said in my picks last week, I love him. He's my favorite. But I just don't see how he's going to stuff a, a, uh, Take a takedown. And, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think Aljo even really shot. No. He he got impatient, started moving forward too much. Instead of, like, you know, playing the boring fight and letting Sugar come to him, he just played right into Sugar's hands with the counter. He did good in the first round. I, I even, I turned to you and I said, to you, like, Aljo's keeping his distance. Like, he's, he's staying out of range. Mm -hmm. And I think, even though the first round was, in everybody's opinion, uh, yeah, not boring, much happened. Boring. Um, once once he played into Sugar's hand, that <laughs> Sugar did what Sugar does. Yeah, and that's what I was hoping. That's what I wanted. But when you just look at the fight without trying to like hope for a miracle, which in many Sterling ways he kind of it wasn't a miracle because he's talented enough to do that, which he did. But you know, just like everything went his way. Yeah, and I just wasn't sure that that was going to happen. So that's why I picked the other way. So similar to like Gary and, and Holland, like Holland's kind of just a striker. Yeah. Ian's got everything. So you know Styles make fights, and I think Gary would whoop his ass. Next one. Zhang Weili versus Lemos. Clinic. Lemos. I mean, 
Clinic. absolute ass whooping, but was so entertaining at yeah. the same time. Clinic. Nemo's got a chin, did not. I mean, a couple times I thought she was going to tap. A couple times I thought Wei Li was going to tap. A couple times I thought Nemo's was going to get knocked out. Mm-hmm. And she just did not go out. This fight did not let up. It was very one-sided, but very entertaining. Surprised yeah. it wasn't a knockout. Yeah, same. It was one of those... Uh, it was one of those fights. It was like a Volk versus Brian Ortega, mm-hmm. um, where Ortega got that one submission attempt in, yep. and he locked it in, and you're like, holy shit, how is Volk going to yep. get out of there? And Lamos did the same thing to Wei Li, and, and I, said, I said it after it happened, that it, a champion does what a champion does. She got out of that, and she turned the tides quick. And then whooped her ass for trying whooped to choke her. her. Ass. That was not even close. That's a great a callback person. ledge because that's exactly what happened. That choke was one of the few, not few, because there's many great moments of the night, but one of those like peak moments what everyone in the stadium was like, holy shit, she's actually gonna choke her. Everyone yeah. is in shock. Shock. Nice. Everyone you the stadium got mad loud, like you couldn't believe it was about to happen. And then when she got out of it and started fucking ground and pound, everyone was like, Yeah. And uh, on the ground, Wei Li, I mean, I knew Wei Li was good. Um I, I knew she was a good fighter, but on the ground, man, seamless transitions made it look easy against yeah. against the Brazilian, and they're known for their their wrestling, mm-hmm, their ground game. And they, they made it look easy, man. Yeah, uh, Whaley's just one of the one of them fighters, one of the champions. She's she's gonna hold on to that belt for a, for a while, yeah. I think. Yeah, agreed. I don't know who challenges her. Agreed. I don't know. It's close. But I know that they're trying to get her to fight in China for the next card, which should be very cool. I would love to see it. That would be awesome. The China card would be fire. It was awesome when she walked out uh, in the lights where the, the Chinese colors. Yeah. And same for Lemos. It was it was awesome. Oh, all those moments throughout the night, the certain you know walkout songs that we alluded to earlier, like all that shit was... Speaking the whole of night was just incredible. so entertaining. One of the goaded uh, walkout songs was actually Sean O'Malley's walkout song. Mm-hmm. Talking about being a champion, or, or if you are on the screen, it was talking about are. that he's a star, and after this fight, if he wins, he could become a superstar. Yeah, yep. And then cuts to black, and then the superstar song comes yeah. on, and you're just like, man, if you were trying to write your own movie where it all works out for you, this is beautiful. Yep. And then he did it. Yeah. And becomes a superstar. It's just like poetry live in front of you i was thinking i was thinking it was like if sean didn't win it's just weird because every single trailer it's all sean o'malley they hardly show all jermaine sterling everyone in the crowd all sean o'malley fans the the song choice mm-hmm. the 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 previews everything was guided no. towards sean o'malley if he lost it would have been the most like depressed no one would have been happy no. With that, so the fact that he did win, it's kind of like the UFC all built it up, and it's kind of like it was meant for him mm-hmm. to win. And when he won, everyone was satisfied. Even mm-hmm. after the fight, when do you ever see the UFC post a full knockout mm-hmm. on their social? Yeah, I've heard videos? that being talked about a lot. Never. It's this... always it, when you go into Instagram after a fight, it's always a celebration mm-hmm. of the fighter just getting up, just after the ref calls it. It's never seeing the full knockout they said send this shit to the moon yeah. we want to make this kid our next superstar and i don't he blame has them. a chance to if anyone's had a chance or will have a chance that we're aware of to surpass connor type level he has the ability to yeah. do that yeah. he has the style to do that he has the charisma the personality the authenticity the marketability the character the look like he has everything that you could ask for yeah. to create a superstar. And now it's just up to him to keep knocking people out. And he, I hope and pray he has a long reign. Oh, yeah. I really do. I want him on that throne for like a while. That yeah. would be dope, man. If someone like him stays at the top and we don't have like a, a wrestler at the top of the division in every fucking division, like that would be really nice. And he's so young. Yeah. Where's where he's still a young fighter, still learning. Where's he 25, 26, um, 27 ish? Right, right there, mid twenties. He has he has the um he has that I can't think of the word. Oh my age. Oh, all right. Wait, no, I'm I'm actually gonna be that on Friday. Oh, your birthday is this week. It is. Thank you, man. Thank you. Happy yeah. Birthday. Thanks, bro. Did I tell you I'm going away for the weekend? Uh, 
No. I don't know where I'm going. Um, oh, is this a surprise trip? Bella's surprising me. Ooh. And we're just going to go somewhere, run away. We always talk about running away. Yeah. Watch it be the batch house. Damn. So last episode of the podcast, and he's running away. He's leaving his whole life behind him. <laughs> yeah. Fine. It's just going to be me and me and fam from now Imagine on. Imagine I just disappear. <laughs> yeah. I'll be sick. <laughs> Let's pretend. You do that. You yeah, do that thing where the cats are Yeah. And they just, just vanish. <laughs> Armand, you can make that happen, right? I'm sure you can. Yeah, man. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited for uh, birthday weekend. You know, I thought about doing a late night Thursday stream because I wanted to do one Friday. Um, but I'm going to be away. I think I'm going to play golf in the morning with my dad and then go away in the afternoon. But nice. we'll see. That's awesome. Okay. Final, final one. Aljamain Sterling, Rashawn O'Malley, right? We've been talking about this. And we've talked about it a lot throughout this whole conversation, but how can you not? The big takeaways are like, yeah, it's just unbelievable. I mean, he was practicing in the back room. The footage has been released. Same, same thing as Connor when he had the footage released after the Aldo knockout. Same counter punch, different hand. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And for someone that feels like they've been manifesting their dreams out loud to the world for a while to see it come to fruition, it's like. Destiny. Yeah. And that's what Izzy was saying in his reaction uh, when he uploaded it to YouTube today after the knockout. He was like, destiny. Destiny. Yeah. And that's just, that's inspiring. Yeah. That, like, is truly inspiring to my core. Like, to see someone's destiny fulfilled. And not only is it that, but it's seeing how years before they were talking about this destiny that they wanted to achieve and seeing it come and happen, you know, cause sometimes you just catch them at the end and then they accomplish things and it doesn't hit the same way, but to see them on the road to getting there is just like, wow. Wow. Incredible. Any of us can do anything we want. If we put our minds to it, we can achieve the greatest of dreams. Yeah. So inspiring. If you're dedicated enough and willing to like, yeah, I don't, I don't care what happens. Like, you know, mm -hmm. he lost to Cheeto Vera and you know, he took that loss and, Already took a loss, but you know, yeah. continued on the track and grew just from didn't it, didn't give up, grew from it, and just continue trucking on it. If you truck hard enough, then yeah. you know, you and, get to that spot where you want. And I thought, I thought another really valuable thing to add about this fight is afterwards in the uh, press conference, which after every UFC card, I watch all of them, yeah. all the interviews, everything. I love it. I fucking eat that shit up. I feel like a journalist. Um, but Al Jermaine was. Acting exactly how a champion who lost should act. Mm -hmm. And I loved that because I was worried a little bit about how he would respond to the loss. Yeah. And to see him lose how you've seen, how I've seen champions lose. Because I watch these press conferences. Yeah. And I think, like, honestly, some of the most valuable info that I get in my life sometimes is watching press conferences of champions losing. Yeah. Because it's like, man, you were at the lowest of lows when you were just at the highest of highs. What's your mindset? How are you feeling? How are you processing? And I feel like you can learn so much. And to see Aljo act like Kumara when he lost, act like Izzy when he lost, just very humble and honest. And, hey, I got caught. This is what happened. Yeah. And, um, it doesn't change who I am. I'm appreciative of the life that I live and, and the family that I have and the ability that I get to keep fighting. And. Uh, you know, this hurts right now, but I'm going to learn from this and be better. And, and not like, even, oh, that's... And not even stooping to the to the early stoppage. Because I, I, I'm going to be honest, and this might, you know, make some, certain people, but it, it was a bit of an early stoppage. I mean, Aldro, he got rocked, went to the ground, but you saw him kind of defending. Sean did land some shots, but when the fight stopped, Aldro had just turned around and was kind of blocking and you can kind of see it was like this is a good position for him to get back up and he was kind of making his way back up and it's it was stopped and i'm not saying that you know alderman sh for sure would have gotten up i could definitely see sean O'Malley uh hitting more ground and pounds and kind of getting him down there and kind of getting the ref but i think the ref could have just let it gone a little bit longer just to get that you know all right that was a for sure stoppage because right now it's a little bit iffy. At least for me, I'm I rewatch and I'm watching it over and over again, and I'm kind of like, it was a bit early in my opinion. 
I I can see the argument for both sides. Um, when I watched it live and when I watched it back, I felt like it was fine. I was. Okay I felt like well. Sean connected multiple shots consecutively without being blocked, and then as Aljamain continued to really just not even scramble, really just fight for his life, then gets hit twice so hard his head bounces off the canvas. Yeah, they and he's gushing blood out of his right eye. So oh, I didn't see the blood. Yeah, oh, yeah. He was from bleeding. from the initial uh, punch oh, yeah. that knocked him down. Yeah, yeah, he got stitches on his eyebrow. Uh, it's hard to see with his sunglasses in the press conference. It kind of hides it. I could also see the argument. Uh, just watching him go on his stomach uh, in that position. You want yeah, when he Sean gave up his back, I exactly. felt like that was a show of surrender. Yeah, I felt like I'm with you. He didn't like go that. to the side and then like try and get up like. And and I I do think that as a professional fighter, you know the weaknesses in the system. And you know certain techniques of what do refs want to see to show that you're still active in the fight. And I think Aljamain in that situation that he's put in by Sean has to know, okay, if I do these certain things, he might call it. I can't show any signs of surrender. Mm -hmm. And I think after getting hit so many times in a row without blocking any of them and then going to your stomach and giving up your back. That was a pretty, pretty good sign. Yeah. You know, I I felt like, I felt like it was enough. It's funny because when I showed it to Bella, she thought it was an early stoppage as well. Yeah, It's because like he, it's close. I see both sides. When I was looking at it, I was looking at how many hits did Sean get? He missed a lot of the hits. He did hit uh, he did. Uh, Aljermaine, but he when he went, when he was on his back, I didn't see that many powerful hits for them to stop it. It was just because he went on his back, and then he went yeah, on but, top but, of him. But, but I think that's like looking for, because the blow happened already that yeah. brought him to his knees and buckled him. Like that was really the end of the fight, and then just giving him another few seconds to try and recover, and then getting hit again, kind of like you know ends that question yeah of is he still in or not but here's the thing though it was like yeah he went on the ground but like that's recovery time he could have recovered and got back up he could have but sean's punch could have woken him back up as well yeah because that happens a lot but fighters are down on their days and according to sean in his podcast today that he released he said that he saw aljo's eyes turn to the back of his head multiple times so you fucking hit his head off the canvas again then he's like oh shit and Aljo in his press conference said that he he understood because he might not have given the ref a good enough justification because when the ref looked at him and asked him what state we're in, he said he didn't know. Yeah. And Aljo's reasoning for that was like, I didn't know like Massachusetts because I didn't, you know, I don't really say Massachusetts and I don't come here. Yeah. I thought we were maybe in Vegas, but even that's like, bro. Yeah, I mean, come on, but that, you, you know you're in Massachusetts. That's after the fact. Your days, you're you're yeah. out of it. You know, you're not exactly. That's after the fact. It's yeah, twenty twenty vision. Like, yeah, I know I was in Massachusetts. Yeah, ref looked at you and you didn't know where you were. Yeah, I feel like yeah, what's if that's the first question after you know calling the fight, <clears throat> then it feels pretty justified. If he's like, dude, I'm in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm fine. Get off me. It's like, oh, maybe. But if if he was out of it, he was out of it. Yeah, yeah. but I see both sides. Yeah, I get it. Like if I was a huge you know, sugar. Uh, well, I am a sugar fan. If the if it was crossed, right, it was the other way around, I'd probably be like, yeah, you might have done it. You might have. I mean, I'm a I'm a sugar uh, I'm a sugar Sean fan for sure. I wanted him to win. I told yeah. we bet Alderman because we see the the skill, but it was like yeah, I'm saying more as a fact. It was like for there to be a more concrete, like no, Sean definitely won that. I would have let it go a little bit longer. Like maybe let him get a couple more hits and where you can kind of see. Do you think like, it affects right. the victory at all? Me personally, I know Sean is like maybe not at the moment, but maybe even rewatching it, there might be a part of him that maybe like How about you? Won't admit it. For me it did. For me, like you it, feel like it changed the, the dub a little a bit. A little bit. A wow. little bit. Look, I but wouldn't here's go the thing. that far. Here's the thing. I like not saying that he wouldn't have won. That's the thing I keep on I saying. Got folded, bro. No, he did, but here's the thing. How many times you see people get rocked, go to the ground? But then they regain that and they get back up. 
And Al Jermaine, yeah, it, it happens often. Yeah, but like the thing is, like I still believe, like if you let it go a little bit longer, I, it would have been more concrete that Sean won. I'm mm-hmm. not saying that Sean wouldn't have won. It would have just been more concrete that Sean had won. Them stopping it early, maybe the decision would have still been the same where Aljo was out. But you stopping it that early kind of gives some leeway as like if Aljo yeah, wanted to pull that, question in there. if he wanted to pull that, it was an early stoppage. Then it's kind of like now you got to run it back now because it kind of leaves it up in the air. Yeah, which Aljo wants to do, by the way. He wants to run it back. Yeah. But I don't think Sean wants that. I think he's like, bro, I don't want to give this motherfucker a second chance. Like I just I hit the jackpot. Yeah. So I don't blame him, and he can go to somewhere. I don't blame though. him. I don't blame him as well. Yeah, let's move on. And who Joe. likes and now? Joe, like just move up a week class. Yeah, which and, is and what you who kind of likes those those rematches? It, it's like nah, it's you can't rare after a stoppage rare. unless nah. you're Israel Adesanya. Israel Adesanya. Then there was um, Davidson Figueredo versus Brandon Moreno. And Camaro did as well, actually. Yeah. Around when Usman, but like those were all ones are like, yeah, like I'd love to see that. And those were later rounds too. Yeah. Like Izzy was round four when he got knocked out, I think. Kamara was round five. Like this was second round, and, early in the round. And each one of those, they had a reason. So Izzy was winning, and then he got exactly kind of like thing, a, a end quote lucky shot. Same thing with Kamara, end quote lucky shot. I say end quote because they're all very planned. And yeah, and on the scorecards, you could argue that Kamara won probably every round, maybe lost one round. Oh yeah, no. It's no, 100%. Yeah, yeah, that's not even like a debate. He for sure won, dominated uh, Leon Edwards. But Elian, Leon Edwards has got, and then mm-hmm. that last fight where they kind of had the rematch, Leon destroyed him. Yeah. Destroyed. But yeah, so like for this one, it's kind of like, I don't think UFC is going to want a rematch because I don't think Hell no. no one's going to be that interested. Hell no. Because Al- no, no one Al- wants Al Jermaine to, to win. And oh. he got rocked. He got folded. And that's what happened. <laughs> I want to see Shido Vera again. I want to see Sean get that. I think that. that's going to be a boring fight. I think Sean knocks him the fuck out. But Sean wants that win because the only person he's lost to is Shido. And mm-hmm. he wants to prove that Shido's a boring fighter and he wants to prove that he can get him out of there. And it was a fluke. Yeah. Because I think in the fight, Shido hit him like in the knee somewhere that like he felt shut off the nerve and he couldn't, if you watch the fight, he yeah. couldn't like step on his yeah, foot. For sure. Like it just wasn't functioning. He kept rolling his, his ankle. So he feels like it was a fake win because. Yeah. But I mean, a win, a win's a win. You, it's like Leon Edwards. You can say Karamo is like, oh, it was a lucky shot of it. No, shot the yeah, shot. Yeah, and it also Cheeto um, meant to hurt him. Yeah. So if he does something to hurt him that affects his limbs, like I mean, that's the whole point. So yeah, valid as well. Valid as well. I want to see Cheeto, and then I actually really want to see Sean O'Malley versus uh, Henry Cejudo. I know Sehudo is calling Sean O'Malley how he wants Ugh, that. I don't want that I fight. I like Sehudo. I don't, I don't like, think so. I either. like Sehudo, and I would I don't love want to that see that. Fight. I don't want that fight because I know it's just going to be Sehudo humping him the whole time. But Sehudo does stay on the feet. Yeah. He does like exchanging. He, has, he does. He, has he does. He, he, defense he likes reason. the ball, but he's a wrestler. And he. Yeah. And now it's like, oh, shit. I lost to the guy I wasn't supposed to lose. Now I I need this win to win. Yeah. So he'll just wrestle the whole time. I, I just think from an interesting perspective, it's not a fun fight to watch. I agree. Um, I disagree. I, want I think it could be entertaining in the buildup because of the shit talking and yeah. that stuff. That, that but the I, actual exactly. fight, especially since I'm pro sugar, I don't want to see that fight yet. I think like this kid... Climbed the ranks from the contender series. He's the champ. Let's give him two easy title defenses and then and then start feeding him to the big dogs. Like I think it's important to take care of your champions. Give them, you know, an, an, a nice good f- first fight. I think Cheeto is the easiest fight for him. I think you could do Peter Yan again. Uh, you could also do Sanhagen again. And Marab and Henry are his hardest fights. So, yeah. If I'm Sean, I'm taking those two last. Maybe while he's fighting Marlon, we get uh, Sehudo versus Marab. Hundred uh, percent. That's the that fight to Sean. make. Yeah, that's the fight to make. And you could do Corey versus Peter. To be honest, I love Corey. I hope Corey gets his. I, I hope he Me gets too. his uh, time in a spotlight. I hope he could go, he becomes champion, even if it is just for a little bit. But just to for him to go out saying that he was at least champion. I yeah, think he deserves I th- it. I think I think everyone uh, same thing with with Sean is the only challenges for Corey would be Henry and Marab because of the wrestling. Yeah. 
because yeah. of the grappling. Like that's that's their main shit. You know, Piotr kind of goes back and forth. Corey's very versatile. Cheetah's very versatile. Sean's very versatile. But Henry, he he'll stand up on the feet, but he wants to get you down. So does uh, so does Marab. Yeah. I mean, how many shots did Marab have in his last fight? Like a fucking world breaking number. He shot like fifty times or some bullshit. You guys remember that? No. Yeah, I don't know. It happened. Trust. <laughs> so, um, in the are these updated? Is Pedro Munoz now number ten? No, these. Oh no, are no, 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 no. still champion. Never. Yeah. I I just realized that as well. Um. So we didn't say our picks for like the last four fights. We don't. We still don't know our records. Um. Well, I know I only got one wrong. Um. So I'm. I was. Two and two, and I picked. How many fights did we pick? Four. Yeah, four because um, Batista was still in the air. So I'm five and three. And well, once again, I don't remember what were my picks. So I gotta, I gotta. I think you picked. You picked the Lamos. Yeah, I remember. I picked Lamos. So you got two wrong. Yeah, two wrong. Also. I, I know it was said on the last podcast. I picked Lamos just because we were all picking the same people. I I have to be. Oh wait, no, different. you only got one wrong. Who was the other person? No, because you picked. Uh, no, I picked Algerine Sterling with you. Yeah. Uh, I picked Lamos. Oh yeah, you got two wrong. Okay. Once again, Lamos just to be different. We all knew Wei Lee was gonna. Yeah, Sean gonna was my only one. I bet well, against yeah. them. Yeah. I want to say I went Ian Gary as well, and I went Marlon Vera. Yeah. So you lost two. So you are. Uh, six and two, mm-hmm. six and two, five and three, and you got how many wrong? I got zero wrong. That's you got amazing. zero wrong and four right, yeah. and you were what three and one before? Yeah. So you're seven and one. Damn. Can you write that down? Would you mind? Yeah. Let's keep track of our rankings. Armand, Damn. So you're in the lead. I'm still in third. Fuck me. Armand, can you put in the clip where I said that Sean was gonna knock out Alderman, and that I picked him? And that Alice immediately said, that's so stupid. <laughs> or don't. Can or just, just don't do it. <laughs> that's a good clip. You should send that to Armand and DM him for the intro of this podcast. He might do that. Oh, that's a solid idea. Yeah, DM him, please. Man, you were so quick. You were so quick with it, too. Hey, guys, it's just, you know, like, <laughs> I, it's it's no, what Hotep Jesus said. You just got to you know be what? fucking, you know, you got to say it. Absolutes. I don't Absolutes. blame you guys for picking Sterling. Sterling is... By far and away the better wrestler. I would like, have bet insane. on Al Jermaine again if I had to do it all over again. Yeah, yeah, valid. Even if the they do have bet. a rematch, I'm, I'm, I might. If go I'm betting Al-Jumain. my hard-earned money. I'm betting the odds. I think I just and I'm felt the manifestation. The Which, by the way, I was feeling, and when I got to the energy, I was feeling, yeah. and I wanted to say something to you guys, but it's one of those things where it's like, you don't want to jinx it. Don't say it. Yeah, don't say it. But I could feel like. Hey man, if there is any night for Sean to do it, it feels right tonight. Like yeah, I kinda that energy that and, and that the home crowd and then the superstar. Like as the night was going on, you were just like, if you were in that stadium, you're like, yo, he might. That's my workout. Man, yeah. the doors didn't. It's like, even I don't want to say it because I'm a jinx. It. The doors weren't even open, and we were all standing in front of the Bobby Orr statue. Sean O'Malley. Yeah. Just a whole night. Sick man. Crazy. What a fucking night! I can't Incredible wait. Incredible experience. Can't wait. We got to do it again soon. Yeah. All right, guys. Any last words? I'm all set. I'm all set. Sugar Sean. Sugar Sean. Oh, Mally. Oh, Mally. Oh, Mally. Guys. I, by the way, on the video, that was me screaming. That, by the way. That I, was? I remember you asking, like, yo, who's screaming O'Malley? And I'm like, I just stayed mad quiet. I'm like, that was me. Dude, Dude, I just remember screaming at the top of my lungs, like, oh, my fucking God. I I jumped up so I was. I know. I was screaming O'Malley over. <laughs> oh. Oh. Peak life moment, guys. Go get yourself a peak life moment. We'll see you on the next episode. Peace. Peace. Adios. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, what's the problem with both of us wearing it? It just looks weird. I mean, it, I guess it doesn't matter because you can't see the front of my face or the front of me. It's literally just the back of my head. 